Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. We have a really special guest today with Steve Farris, the founder or one of the founders and a great guitar player from Mr. Mister. Uh, a number of listeners have requested Steve, in particular Uwe Wright from Germany. So thanks, Uwe. Uh, I'm going to give you a brief background on Steve. He's got a really good story. This is going to be a great interview. He's sharp as hell. He's funny. He's uh, don't clever. Give me stuff to, don't give me stuff I have to live up to. This is. Except <laughs> <laughs> uh, now. Uh, I'm setting the bar. Uh, so this yeah. Steve story is not about a musician who retired to become a hunter. Actually, it's about a hunter and outdoorsman who put a pause on that passion to become a musician. So he began hunting and immersing himself in nature at age three, started playing guitar at age nine. Again, founding member, co-writer, co-producer and guitarist for the 80s rock group, Mr. Mister, nominated for two Grammy Awards and sold over four million albums with Mr. Mister two number one hit singles and one number one album, which was Welcome to the Real World, uh, which was the 10th largest album sold in the United States in 86. As a side man, he's played or recorded with over 150 artists, including Robin Gibb, Gary Wright, Vasco Rossi, Eros Ramazzotti. Those two guys are massive over in Italy. Uh, huge pop stars. Kiss, Rod Stewart, Eddie Money, Dolly Parton, Johnny and Edgar Winter, Alice Cooper, Graham Nash, Rick Derringer, Madonna, white snake a ton of them however hunting was always a constant distraction from music for him actually. uh his art and hunting. i like that distraction yes that's, that's, uh, it was your that was your uh, bio it was good oh what oh God. yeah you did a good job on that it was one of the best well, I, ones I, I, I drink a lot i don't know if you remember what i said but you know. that was good keep it up man uh his art and hunting skills met up when he began purchasing land 21 years ago. He's now hunted in three continents, seven countries, and 28 states. Today, Steve's retired from the music business, but occasionally takes on a few select opportunities to do music, such as short tours to Europe and an occasional recording session. That means you have to buy the shit out of him to get him to go play, but he'll do it. <laughs> uh, he's happily married. He spends time taking care of his hunting lands and his hunting operations. He's got a whole really fantastic story. Uh, he's Right now, he's immersed in hunting, both as a vocation and a business. He's involved with design and implementation of wetlands restoration and enhancement, as well as ongoing land management for productive and consistent hunting. He owns and operates an annual membership hunting club, and he's got all sorts of things going in other hunting land facilities and clubs. He also consults on improving habitat and hunting quality, and his clients include private corporations and actually the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So he's a real deal, right? You're working for the government. You got to be the real deal. Well. <laughs> yeah, well, that conversation going over ways, but yeah. <laughs> and he's uh, filmed and hosted dozens of hunting shows on television and cable networks here and abroad. Man, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah, thank man. Uh, yeah, I am too. Uh, you were born and raised in eastern Nebraska. Both your parents were creatives. Your mom was a professional artist. Your dad was a musician, an avid outdoorsman, a wildlife photographer, and a businessman. So my question is, how did growing up in that environment influence you in a few different things? First of all, your interest in music. Well, I mean, I look, artist, creative things, I, like it's genetically in me. I mean, I could draw notably good by the time I was three or four years old. I mean, I wouldn't have known this. My mother, who was professional, kind of, they just kind of knew it. it was always that way. And so I, I always tell this story about when I was in first grade, I went to Catholic school and then we had a nun, Sister Faith, who was the quintessential <laughs> badass, hard ass, get you out of Catholic religion as fast as you can because you hate how much she's wrapping you on the knuckles. But anyway, Sister Faith had us come up to the front uh, blackboard and everybody draws something that started with the letter T. And guys were drawing tack, or tire, or whatever. And I went up and I drew a tiger that was crouching in the grass coming out. Of at you and uh you know i they called my parents they said yeah we know i i, I sound braggadocious but i don't mean to i just like that was that was what i could do i could draw that's awesome and i was always that way so i uh that's what i was going to do all my life it was just sort of noted you know my brother was very brainy smart or he was he was going to become a doctor you know or something i mean i was going to be go to art school but then i started playing guitar at nine and stuff and i was in bands i'll talk all about that but the point was i uh when I was graduating from high school, my dad kind of picked up on the idea that as I was looking through art school brochures and stuff, I wasn't really that into it, I guess. And my dad kind of researched some things and talked about music school. And 
he found that uh, there were only five schools in the country that taught guitar programs. That was Berkeley, that was uh, Indiana, that was uh, University of Miami, Coral Gables, North Texas State, and I can never remember what the fifth one was. It was Guitar, uh, uh, guitar Institute out in LA. This was, this was prior, I'm prior to that myself, but that didn't yeah, exist. Yeah. Okay. So, so anyway, I went to Berkeley. Anyway, I, the point is I, I switched from going into art school and when I was 18 years old, that's when I said, I'm going to chase music. That's what I'm going to do. And I think that was really a couple of lucky things. Lucky that, uh, fortunate, I should say, but that I had something that I wanted to do and knew what I wanted to do. Because a, a lot of us at that age are kind of, I don't know. What doing. And also because my parents, my mother was an artist and had a fine arts degree from University of Nebraska and did commercial art in, in Chicago before she got married. But my dad was a drummer, just growing, not professionally, but growing up and he was like kind of artistic guy. And then he got into a business, taking over the family business, which he never really liked. Uh, so I grew up as a generation second to them that didn't do what they wanted to do. Right. So that's all, I, that's all they pumped on me was all the time. Figure out what you want to do and be the best at it. And that was the greatest upbringing because they're extremely supportive, kind of bragging, but yeah. supportive. And it gave me this confidence all along to roll through it. I think to do anything in music or any of these kind of professions, you got to find some confidence. Because I mean, you're going to get the shit beat out of you sooner or later. I don't care yeah. how good you are before you get there. Totally. And so that's I don't know. That's a long answer, but no, it's a, it's a very accurate answer. Uh, obviously, your interest in wildlife because you your dad your 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 dad was immersed in it, and obviously you were yeah. too. Yeah. 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 No, my dad was dad was an outdoorsman, man. I, I always brag about my dad. He has a fly tying credit from the University of Nebraska, as if any place teaches fly tying in college. Oh my God, that's hilarious. <laughs> my favorite thing man i mean i said the hunters are like damn that's good um so dad was you know he he courted my mother at, at summer job well in went to college they met each other at the university of Nebraska. But they would go to sun valley idaho where they did summer jobs and that's where they were courting and that's where dad learned to fly fish and stuff but he grew up hunting before that shooting and he was never a big game guy he was a he was a bird hunter and a and a fly fisherman but i mean i was fascinated by wildlife as long as i can remember that's how that story probably when you read something about three years old i didn't necessarily start hunting when it's three but i can the story goes and dad used to tell it forever is that i'm out in the backyard and uh he came out so even time for dinner and i go i know dad but look it's crickets i point at some crickets and i don't come in he comes out of the while there's stephen ferris i told you to get in it's time for dinner. I said, I know, Dad, but look, crickets. And by the third time, you know, God damn it, Stephen Matthews Ferris. You know what I mean? When the full name comes out, and you get it. I said, Dad, but look, crickets. So I've always said that might be the title of my biography is Crickets. Crickets, yeah, man. I was Absolutely. fascinated about animals all along. And so I always said I was probably, a, if there were past lives, I was a duck hunter in the past life because all I can remember is looking at books of ducks when I was a little kid, and Dad would go on hunting trips. And you know, it sounds kind of, grotesque but they clean birds he'd bring me back heads like show me a pheasant head or a duck head and i thought that i'd take him to school for show and tell <laughs> back in the day man and so you know i just i just i, I was gonna hunt as soon as he'd take me on it but yeah. i mean i was walking around with a pellet gun in my hand when i was six years old all day long we lived on a lake and i just i mean i've been shooting guns as long as i can remember how did that influence you? I would imagine growing up and immersed in the wildlife like that, it, there's a there's a huge influence spiritually. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you hear guys say it kind of like almost going to say my church is the outdoors. And I said, but I mean, I never feel closer to God than when I'm out in the wild. Yeah. I uh, and I always have, and I'm a big believer in God, and I I'm a big prayer. I pray a lot, and that's a lot of my. I, I'm a Catholic also, but really. I don't even know if I am sometimes I go to church, but I pray all the time. I find myself, especially these days when I'm out on my land, I can't believe I'm so thankful. Yeah. I can't believe how fortunate I am. And I get down on my knees. I get down on my knees every day out here a lot. Yeah. And I thank God. And I just look around and I go, this is, this is it. And so many things in my life revolve around my belief in nature. Even when it gets to politics, no one will right. get into that. Yeah, no. but I mean, even when it gets into certain things, our nature, and I think human beings fight a lot of what nature really is. That's a long conversation. But well, no, it's the, true. They don't. There's no uh, go with the flow. It's like very willful, and there's a lot well, of shit out there. Very willful, and it's also 
Oh man, I'm not going to get into there right now. But I mean, <laughs> question <I> one. <laughs> well, yeah, segment two. But uh, you know, but I mean, just things about nature were just—it's always been been it. So it rules me really. That's really cool. It's interesting you said that because I was not a guy that grew up with any any religion at all, and it's only been in the last few years that I've had a connection with a higher power, right? Yeah. And I always, almost always pray when I'm outside That's because right. I, I don't know. I just feel like they're just when I'm walking. Yeah. No, I, I get it. Yeah. There's just, it's like, it feels, I, I mean, have I have, be, yeah. I have to be thankful. I also ask for, because God will provide, God will yeah. provide, God will provide. Yeah. Matter of fact, what I just said is a prayer of mine, constantly if i get depressed or anything I, I let that mantra go in my head because it's always true yeah yeah sooner or later and if you just can follow where he leads you you're usually in a good place yeah i agree with you there man uh and 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 i guess the, your the how did all that influence you as far as which you kind of talked about your overall personal philosophy on how you view life how you view life steve and how you handle problems which i guess is it related kind of just started to say it really yeah and i just started to say it i mean yeah look man i gotta tell you i mean we can talk about all the great blessings of my life and everything and there are many and mm. you can hit the high points i was a rock star i was this i made a lot of money i mean I, I mean, but i mean dude we can go through the bad list too i mean the depression highs and ups and downs and the erratic life of being in the in an entertainment field i mean I think what you learn now, at least for me, um, you learn that most of the guys you see on TV, the actors, and most of the rock stars, I mean, it ain't always going good all the time. Yeah. Monetarily and otherwise. Some of them, you know, get really, really huge, the U2s or the Rolling Stones or whatever. But I mean, most people are, so you seem like they're, you think it's all going great, and then you don't see them in a the movie. Well, and they're probably hustling, man. I mean, it's, it's a very unsteady life. Yeah. And that adds into a lot of, you know, weird things of just trying to keep your head straight because you know, just in a real basic example, you make some money, you go buy a house at the level you can buy because it's a smart thing to do. It's the best ride. You know, there's a, there's a number that you're supposed to get. Right. It might've been $250,000. It might've been a million and a half, whatever it was. Sure. And you're, you're like, you're grooving on that. And then pretty soon you aren't making any money. You can't afford those payments, but really you needed to get those type. It's, Whereas other people have jobs that kind of, oh, my salary's this, or I basically make that. And I keep doing it every year in a row for 10 years. That's, you can plan with that stuff. Yeah. And, and that, that keeps, a, I think, a, your head on a little straight. When you can't plan, it gets really dicey. And I think a lot of what I've gone through, uh, you know, prayer gets me out of it a lot, but it's not, it's, it's, it's a belief. It's not just a prayer. It's like, you got to find yourself believing. Yeah, I know it's going to work out if I stick to it and just keep doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Yeah, I know. Huh. Do you know who Danny Korchmar is? You ever heard his name, the guitar player? I know Danny. I knew Danny Korchmar very well. I know Danny Korchmar well in in this respect. Greg Ladani was a good friend of mine. You remember Greg Ladani? Yeah, I remember the name. I don't know him, but well, he's, he's he has since passed. He was a producer, but he and he and Korchmar produced Boys of Summer. Uh, right. Right. Okay. Greg comes at it from he was the engineer and Korchmar was the musician and stuff. And as a matter of fact, years down the road later, like I did some, I played it because I became good friends with the uh, Russ Kunkel too, who was the drummer. These the drummer. guys were all that camp, early seventies, yeah. you know, uh, LA singer songwriter, Taylor, all that shit. When you know, Lee Scalar, well, Lee and I became good. I did. I played with Lee a million times. I used to hire him for all kinds of sessions and stuff. But I mean, I became friends with Russ Conklin and he called me in on a couple of things where there, was, there were these benefits. Like we did an Earth Day benefit and I played with what was called the section, which was Craig Durge, Korch, I mean, Craig Durge would have been Korchmar, Wadi Watel, mm. um, Lee Sklar, Russ Conkle, but Danny didn't want to do them anymore. So I, I'd be, I'd fill in his spot, which I was okay. not a generation younger, but I was kind of like- 10 like years. Yeah. yeah. And so I did that a few times. Uh, I did that there, and I also did the Nicolette Larson benefit. I think it was 89. No, not 89. I mean, uh, 79, 78, something like that. No, what am I talking about? I'm dyslexic. 97, 98. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I played on the Nicolette Larson benefit, again, basically filling in for Quartzman. Last time I saw Danny was in Nashville, where I was living for five years, four or five years. 
And uh, Greg Ladani was there interested in a band there. And he called me. I went down to 12th and Porter, which is instantly where I met my wife, eventually. Um, and I saw him there. And of course, when I was hanging out, we hung out a bit. I didn't know Danny well. Yeah. Reason I asked is I had Danny on the show recently and he made a oh, comment did. and he said something about, he goes, and he's been doing this 50 years, right? Yeah, he right. said, every gig you do, there's a part of you in there that swears it's your last gig. Yeah, well, <laughs> and it certainly could be. Yeah. All, right. <laughs> and so, no, and you're always on the edge because most, that's a similar comment. The way he put it is the way he put it, but you get that sort of thing from a lot of guys. They're like, they always feel like they're not getting another gig. I mean, because really that's kind of the life you live. You almost have to treat it like that. And you're always as, only as good as your last gig too. You know that deal. Of you course. Know, always as good as your last record, always as good as your last book, whatever it is. Yeah, man. So yeah, that's, it's just a freaking insecure profession. man. Yeah, very much. So. Uh, you, you said in your bio, you said, I always wonder how much even more successful I might have been in the music business. I know this guy. You send me stuff I read. What can I, I know, tell you? I know that comment, yeah. Had, had, I, had I not been constantly daydreaming about a north wind moving in, so I need to hurry this Madonna session off instead of paying attention. I was doing that instead of thinking about what, what the artist or producer. Yeah, I know, man. I've, I'm famous for walking away from, like, incredible opportunities in the music business. I can name them, you know, people give me numbers, call me, you know, and I, you know, Eddie Van Halen gives me his number, they never call him, no, you know, we, we did a gig together, you know, things like that, Kurt Russell, I was on a celebrity hunt with him, and call me when we get back to LA, did I? No, I don't know, I'm just that guy that doesn't always do it, I, record producer, oh God, I want to say it was Peter Wolf, but he, uh, you know, a big, I never worked for him, calls me, and I just, I, I couldn't do it, because why? Because I was going duck hunting that day up in, up in Central Valley. I don't know, but I guess in the in the end of the day, it's it hasn't been a bad thing to keep two lives going because right now that second that other thing is really going. Yeah, so, and I'm fortunate to have another interest because so many of my friends don't. Oh yeah, especially in the music business today, where you don't do that work like we used to do. I mean, that freelance thing is not like correct. Anymore, period. Correct. You don't make records that way. People are more self-contained. Automation, you know, computers. It's a different world. They make it differently, but that, that, that lineup of, we need an engineer, we need a bass player, we need a... It's, go, it's so, gone. You know, on the wide that, scale. I mean, I know so many guys that have 5 billion credits played on everything, you know, doing other things now, you know, or it just, it's, not, it's just not there. And they don't, they go, you're so lucky because you have another interest. Right. Yeah. Very much. How did you first get started in the music business? And like, what was your first break? Well, I, well, if you're technically a music business, you can say I started playing guitar for money when I was 14. And I never really had another, I had like a day gig for three days one time in LA or whatever. I was, I was always playing for money, starving a lot and in trouble a lot. But, you know, even making 175 bucks a week by playing clubs in LA, you know, still trying to live off that. But I tell you, probably one of the bigger, I'll tell you two stories because they kind of tie in each other. Yeah, cool. But I just got into LA and I, I can tell you, I can make this. I can make them all a longer story. But I'm I'm going down to a place called Josephina's in Sherman Oaks because every Monday night they had a big jam session there, and to this day it's the biggest jam session I've ever seen. Meaning there was just it was just a hang. I mean, everybody in the room or a lot of people in the room had big gigs. They were in Earth, Wind, and Fire or Joy Benson's band. Or I was playing a lot of funk and that kind of stuff then, or they were Long John Baldry or playing with Bowie's band or whatever. But it was a hang. You walk in, there's a pizza place, but on Monday nights, they'd pull some chairs away and put a house band in the corner. They'd play a set, jazz, and then they have people sit in. And I mean, it was kind of political. You'd get there and, and I mean, there'd be 20 guys walking around with drumsticks, playing their thigh, getting ready. There'd be guys with guitar cases. There'd be trombone, trumpet player. I mean, it was just a hang. And everybody doing blow in the bathroom too, all that shit. <laughs> so, um, you know, that had to go along with it. So, I was down there one time and and I could tell you the whole story about that because that's kind of an interesting story about flopping the first time then doing better the next time. But one night I was in there and here was a bunch of guys hanging out at the bar. They're English guys. Well, they weren't all English guys, but they're rock looking guys. One of them happened to be English. They were in a band called Player. Do you remember Baby Come Back? Oh yeah, back? Baby Come Back, sure. I had just seen them like on Midnight Special or one of those shows recently, so I recognized them. I don't know, I don't know I'm talking to them. We go to bullshit and they said, yeah, we're, you know, we're looking for a guitar player. So I play guitar. 
So I go to an audition for them and they love me when I start playing guitar with them. I played for about a month with them. And that was the first kind of name gig. I'd only been in only maybe two, three months. I mean, I, I'm calling home. I gotta, I'm in play, you know. It was all great. And then about a month into that gig, their manager uh, comes down and reminds them that the guy they had lost, John, I'm not saying his name, but he was one of the lead singers and guitar player. So they really need to replace a guitar player and lead singer. And so they asked me about singing. And I was like, I don't sing. <laughs> and anyway, I don't sing. Anyway, the long story short is I lost the gig after playing with them for a month because I didn't sing. And of course, right then you can imagine pretty heartbreaking. You're new in town and you're like, you think you got a gig with a name act, now you don't. And yeah. Much bigger than when that happens later, which it will also. <laughs> but uh, anyway, the next sort of really big thing. Well, all right, if that, I'm supposed to get a gig with Brenda Russell, because, oh, that's, yeah. but the really, the, I think the really big thing is, I mean, I was at a band called the Mambo Jets. The other three guys in the band were from Poco, if you remember that name. Yeah, of course. Great band. Well, it was, it was Kim Bullard on keys. It was um, Charlie Harrison on drums. and I mean, Charlie Harrison on the bass. And um, Steve um, Chapman on drums. They were on Poco's band. Kim Bullard was one of the first guys I met. I actually met him on the player gig. But anyway, we, we put together an original band. They'd written it, but it was kind of a showcase for me. So I wasn't writing the songs, but I played a shitload of guitar on it. We're out doing gigs, you know. We were playing the Blue Lagoon Saloon in Marina del Rey, and you know, I like I, I used to really shine in that band. I walked off stage; it was very packed. I walked around the back, and some guy comes up to me and wants to talk to me, and lets me know. He said, "Will you be interested in auditioning for Kiss?" And I'm like, "Why would I want to do that? I got a Volkswagen Rabbit that doesn't run unless I push it and pop the clutch. <laughs> I eat Campbell's soup every night. Why the fuck would I want to join Kiss?" So anyway. <laughs> Um, so he gives me a number. She called this number. She's handling the auditions because Ace Freely's leaving the band. It was 1982. I go, okay. So I call her. She said, we'll put together a tape of your stuff. And come down. So I get together with Tony Peluso, who was the guitar player of the Carpenters, but he was an engineer also. And I had done a couple sessions that he recorded. And I always liked him. And I went over to his house and he helped me just copy over. I had cassettes, tons of cassettes and shit. We I just found things, shit, I found things live that I played at bars in Iowa before I moved to LA. Other this or those sessions. This is some stuff I produced before I moved to LA that almost got me a gig with Brenda Russell's instrumental. I just put together, you know, a compilation of a show off tape. And I go down to that. She says, come on down. It's down to Sunset Boulevard. I think about Sunset and Gower, I can't remember. And I go into her office and she's there. And she sits down and listens to the tape with me in the room and doesn't look impressed. I leave there thinking another day in the life, whatever, no big fucking deal. And about two weeks later, I get a phone call and, go, and it says, is this Steve Ferris? I go, yeah. I said, well, this is Paul Stanley from Kiss. He said, Gene and I listen to the tape, but we really like it. We want to know if you want to come down to the record plant tomorrow. That's how we're holding auditions. We just have guys play. What time? Two o'clock. I'll be there with bells on. So yeah, I go down there and I had been in the record plant before a couple of times because a friend of mine, got us in late in the middle of the night for free studio time at you know one in the morning but i now i'm walking in daylight hours i walk by the tom petty's walks in one room goes out the other luther bandros is talking on a pay phone i can't remember the third superstar that was there but in the back studio d i get the back hallway and here's the sliding glass doors going into the control room and you can see two guys in there that obviously paul stanley and gene simmons but you've never seen it without mike makeup back then i mean mm. now you do but you had never yeah. seen it I can tell that's got to be Paul Stanley and there's an engineer sitting down and there's a guitar player standing there playing. And I kind of walk in, oh yeah, great, Steve. Hey, can you come outside? And we we're listening to another guy. I come out, sit in the hallway here and I, sure. I remember sitting there for like three hours while, while, while they get played, which is a long three hours. That's nerve wracking. But man. I got to tell you something. I had already kind of gotten a real, I'd already gotten some skin on me by then, some thick skin about things. And I always said, I don't want to talk to anybody before I play. I don't talk about my playing. I don't want to talk about anything. All I want to do is to walk softly carry a big stick so i was like i'm not gonna talk to him you know i'm gonna go and play i had my valley art strap which was sort of new to me then i just had it made because i'd gotten all my shit ripped off and i had some insurance money anyway, i got my valley art strap and i had a c1 chorus pedal that paul Revere had modified and uh and a goodrich volume pedal. and i finally they walk out and the guy walks the guitar walks out oh yeah this is bob tulick hey bob Okay, no right. Bob, yeah. his brother Bruce. But anyway, right. I, hey Bob, how you doing, man? Blah, blah, blah. They walk out. I go into the room and Paul gives me a chord. He goes, I got a Marshall out in the other room. Just plug in here. I plug in my volume pedal and my chorus and my, he goes, uh, this song's in G. It's 
got like an eight bar solo. We'll scroll you up to the bridge and I'll count you in. Mm -hmm. And I go, all right. And of course, by this time, I should mention, I, I wanted to be a studio. I wanted to be a hot shot. I wanted to be a hired gun. I wanted to be like, go in, fucking nail it right away. All right. So I was kind of, I was already kind of boned up. Of course, I was nobody, but I was kind of boned up. And I was, the guy, the, the producer's name is uh, Michael James Jackson. Okay, he's sitting there. His credits were like Sean Phillips and other things. He's not, not much of a hard rock guy, but he's sitting there running the tape. Paul's on the other side of the, the console looking at me and Gene's standing here. And I listen to it and they, I've never heard the song. They run the scroll it up and he goes. And I play a take and they go, give him another track. I go another track. They stop the tape and go, will you dye your hair black? I go, yeah. <laughs> You wear high heels? I said, I'm give it a try. I said, don't fucking cut your hair. And they just started going nuts. Well, that second take of an audition remains the solo on the Creatures of the Night song on the Creatures of the Night album. Wow. The second take of my audition. Top to bottom, no punch. And I have done three interviews about that solo in the last two years still. It seems to be wow. one of the most famous things I've ever done. <laughs> and here it was an audition. Well. They went nuts and it was the weekend. I remember it was a Saturday or something. Said, well, let's get together again on Monday or Tuesday, whenever it is. Come back. This is great. This is great. So, and I remember, you know, Michael James, you're looking at me, you're happening, man. I mean, it was just like one of those moments of <laughs> crushed it. So I left there in my Volkswagen Rabbit, you know, going back to Van Nuys where I lived. I had two other roommate, musician roommates. I didn't really tell anybody about it because again, I got into the smart, the smart money is keep your mouth shut and just mm -hmm. see that. But anyway, so I ended up playing with them, coming back down and playing with them two or three times, doing some sessions. And then they said, let's set it up. We want to play live together. So they went over to SIR. We set up as a band. By the way, that wasn't, um, wasn't the original drummer. Who was the original drummer? Eric Carr was playing with him. Uh, the original drummer was um, yeah. uh, that, uh, Peter, Peter Chris. Chris. Peter yeah, Chris. Yeah. Carr yeah. was playing with him. But otherwise, it was Paul, Gene, and, and Eric Carr, and me, and uh, it's Eric, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we played and uh, played a couple of tunes. Where, you know, I had my gear moved in, and, and they said, we want to hear you sing. <laughs> Again with the singing, man. Yeah, that's why I told the player story. I'm like, oh, fuck. <laughs> Yeah. And so sure enough, it's talking me enough. I'll never forget, you know, I said, man, I don't sing. Guys. I don't sing. You know, oh, no. We can sing. And Paul looking at me and he was saying, hey, Steve, I didn't use something I didn't sing either. And blah, blah, blah. And I'm like thinking, well, I can either try to sing right now, maybe get over. Or you can say I can't sing, walk out, and that's the end of it. All right. Those moments, like, I'm going to fucking sing. So I have the dubious distinction of having played Honky Tonk Woman with Kiss with me singing the lead vocal. And if I had a video of any fucking thing, <laughs> I, Jesus Christ, it must have been terrible. Um, I mean, I could sing some backgrounds. I've sung backgrounds, but that ain't lead singing. Anyway, so I didn't hear from him. That was and, it. Uh, well, I didn't for about two weeks. And then I got a call from Paul and he goes, hey, we don't think you're the right guy for the band. We love your playing. We want to keep hiring you to do, to do sessions. Oh, cool! So they did. Simultaneously, I got an off. I got an uh, opportunity to audition for Eddie Money. Right. Alan Pasqua was a friend of mine. He was a keyboard player that is was brilliant, and I think he's teaching now at a college. But he had played with Santana and Eddie and Bob Dylan and lots of sessions. He was a friend, and he hooked me up with this audition. But that's a whole another fucking story. But I I went down and uh, that's a whole story. I, I, it's kind of an interesting story, but but anyway, by the time I was playing session with with uh, with Kiss, Kiss, I'd gotten a gig with Eddie, which took a couple rounds for me to get the gig. That's a long story. And I remember one of the last things I played with Kiss. I'm down at Record Plant playing with them, but I had to leave at two to catch a plane to go to Casper, Wyoming, for my first gig with Kiss. Which is with, is how with Eddie, you mean? I mean with Eddie, yes. Yeah, yeah, with Eddie, and that's sort of that was sort of that 1982. Was like shit. Now I'm starting to work with the big boys. Yeah. And then when I came back from the Eddie tour in six months, that's the start of Mr. Mr. Whatever I could talk. Why don't you ask me questions, man? We'll get 
specific. I had to start rambling. I'm so happy I can remember anything. You know? I'm impressed, man. It's a long time ago. Uh, and and I'm sure I can a... pick off, man, and people know this. If you start pointing out a story, I can start talking about stuff and it goes five different directions because things do. Yeah. Everything leads to another. Everything's a chain of things. Uh, so Eddie, you, you, you worked with, you did a lot of work with Eddie. Well, I did. I went through your, your, your album credits. Yeah, I, I did. I didn't do the album. I did the no control tour after the no control album, but I didn't play on the record. That was a big tour though. It was a big tour. It was shaken and, uh, um, I think I'm in love. Yeah. And no, anyway. And then I did a record with him after that, but that was silent. I was right away. We were putting together Mr. Mr. While I was sneaking from one thing to the other, going to the record plant, playing on on uh where's the party in which i'd written a song with alan pasquale and eddie on that's also where i got to know tom dow the legendary producer who sure. took a great liking to me and was the first guy I did and i did a lot of shit with tom over the years but yeah that was the same time uh, that was 83 you know spring summer of 83 i had a bunch of i've had a few guitarists who worked with eddie and they all loved him they said he was a really good guy to work with a lot of fun he's fun I mean, yeah He's fun. I will say this, and I don't mean this in a bad way, but if you look up the word knucklehead in the dictionary, Eddie's <laughs> picture is right there. And that's a good, that's a, that's an endearing knucklehead. He was just kind of that, hey man, you know, I mean, here's Eddie. I, <laughs> so I could tell a bunch of Eddie's stories, but you know, this is a guy that, this is years after I wasn't playing with him. He was at Kim Bullard's studio. Kim, I mentioned, was in Mama yeah. just. And they were doing, I actually, and I played with Eddie years later on for, um, um, it'll come back here but anyway um kim was there and eddie is going to order pizza and this is a guy who gets on with directly assistance back before google and stuff and goes he's talking to the girl may I help you watch city and she says yeah this is the money man i need to get down with pizza. you know this he introduces himself to the directory the I mean, who would do that you know that's so eddie right uh, <laughs> money man uh, <laughs> you know and and then john nelson was the other guitar player with eddie and me and and you know, it was always the kind of thing that when you were before the show, you'd be walking around backstage and whoever you saw first, whichever guitar player you saw first, he'd want you to sit there and play guitar with him while he warmed up on the saxophone. All right. John Coltrane, Eddie was not. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> he played the saxophone, right? Uh, and so, and he played, uh, anyway, you go, Steve, -o, warm me up. That was the thing you didn't want to hear. Yeah. <laughs> and you'd play it. Da -da 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 -da. I, I, I'm thinking I want to be rock. So I'm trying to think what the name of the song was, but the saxophone while well, I went. <laughs> with the bell right in your face. So it was like that kind of cursive. Oh and I got God. a friend of mine that still, when he calls me up, he goes, Steve, I'll warm me up. Yeah. <laughs> I could tell a ton of Eddie stories. We had, we had a lot of fun on that tour, man. We did. That's cool. Uh, so how did Mr. Mr. come together? I had gotten off the road with Eddie Money. Um, and back in those days, everything was on a Rolodex. You didn't have even Palm Pilots or anything. You know, it was just go home and look at your... And I just, you know, you, the key to music business, a lot of business is networking. You know, you're just trying to... I mean, just just Phoenix days, you're just giving out napkins with your number. And you would write it on a napkin because if you had a card made up, it basically said, he's not working. If he's trying that hard, this guy isn't for real. Oh, interesting. Like, I don't give a shit. That was the whole thing. So you wrote it down a napkin. Anyway, um, I went after Eddie Money. I got off the road and I'm looking through the Rolodex trying to drum up work. And I remember looking at George Giz's number. George Giz happened to have managed a band called um, The Pages. The Pages had a guy named Richard Page and Steve George. And they were a really cool band that the musicians really respected in LA, like really respect. A lot of the hotter studio musicians played on their last, their third record, but they just never you know, got going, any real success, just kind of like a cult people knew about him. I'd seen him, I liked him, and I'd met George somewhere. And I think I'd met Steve George, the keyboard player somewhere. But anyway, when I called George Giz, he goes, hey, Steve and Rich are thinking about putting something together again. You interested in checking it out? I'm sorry, I got to fly. Isn't this great? I can do this all the time. Fly. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, so yeah. So I go out to Richard Page's house out in... Uh, Damn, I almost remembered the name, um, but north of uh, Pasadena. And uh, anyway, I go to his house, and there's Steve George, keyboard player, and Richard Page. And they had a bass player there, and a drummer, and me, and I auditioned for him. And we all hit it, three of us hit it off, but the bass player and drummer didn't make it. 
cut apparently. And so we went through the next period of time trying out bass players and drummers. And about maybe almost two months of that. And I remember I did call Kim Bullard again. I keep mentioning my friend Kim, still a good friend of mine. And I go, man, we need to find drummer. She goes, well, drummer, you see, remember Holly Penfield? She was a girl that came and went and I'd auditioned for her. She was a Mike Chapman production that was going to be a big deal, but wasn't a big deal, like a lot of things. But I remember auditioning for her and not getting a gig. But the guy I played with there was a guy named Pat Mastelotto, a drummer. And she said, you remember Pat Mastelotto? He played with Pally Penfield. Yeah, I remember him. I remember He said, call him, man. He's great, blah, blah, blah. So I called Pat, and then Pat said, I know another guy, uh, a, a bass player. I'll bring him. And we set up an audition like that. So I went over, we went down and we went down, we were in a little rehearsal studio in uh, Studio City. And Pat's warming warm up on drums and you could kind of see this guy's freaking good. But the bass player doesn't show up. And then later on we find, this is back again, you can't call anybody on your cell phone, they didn't exist, but you go home later and you hit your uh, machine voice, voice, uh, voice machine and you find out he couldn't come because they had a emergency dentist problem and blah, blah, blah. So he doesn't make the audition. Incidentally, he becomes the Pete Best of Mr. Mister because of it. <laughs> but he, because uh, Richard Page was sort of multi-talented, could play a little bit of a lot of instruments. Keyboard's probably his best, but he played guitar and stuff. So there was a bass guitar in the room and a SVT amp. We wanted, we had to hear Pat play because, and we were doing songs that those guys had written that were all new wave kind of eighth note, you know pretty simple bass parts and he goes i can play it so he puts on the bass we play it to audition pat it sounds great we look at each other and said four guys is better than five guys so that's when we rich decided i'll play bass in the band oh wow. and he went and bought a bass and that's how we and we that's how he started mr mr and we started rehearsing we did and we rehearsed for i remember correctly about a couple months and and because they had had a previous record deal that when they got let go, I, they had some cash in the bank from it. Um, so they had some money to spend to put on a really elaborate showcase, meaning we leased or rented uh, Super Trap Sound and Lights. We went into a room in SR and made it look really pro to have, plus lots of contacts. Plus, uh, Richard and Steve had sung on everybody's records as background singers. They were like, I think, I think Rich has gotten what is essentially a Grammy a couple of times. Nearest award, I think, for you know, just they'd work a lot, knew everybody. Yeah. So George got everybody down. We had a showcase at SIR, and one for only time we played in front of people, and we had five of the major labels biting right away. Oh. Wow. Right off the bat. So then it became down to I remember one of them was Arista, who was started run by Clive Davis, legend. Mm -hmm. And then Clive. Neil Port now, who we see on the Grammys still to this day, like he'll come out and talk about stuff and great guy, by the way. But Neil was an a &R guy then. I mean, he wanted Clive to come out, which he did. We had to wait for Clive to come out from New York to then see us personally. So we set up a personal, just a private showcase for him. And of course we waited, you know, an hour late for him to be there and he's the big deal. And, and I, I always tell a story because I, because I like it, but I, uh, we get up playing a showcase and Clive walks straight across the whole room. He comes right up to me. And looks up and goes, I, you're a very gifted guitar player. And I always took that as, that's good. He's discovered Janis Joplin and everybody else. <laughs> that was great. And I just been looking kind of down at a short guy. And that was, that was cool. But they walked back and proceeded to talk to management and said he's passing on the band because we didn't have enough pop sensibility. That was the word. We remember that word. I remember that word to this day. He didn't have enough pop sensibility. Passed. So, um, we had a, we went, played one more time live out at, I can't remember the name of this club anymore. It was in Studio City. And we played a set out there and God, so many people came in because of Rich and Steve's connections. I mean, Kenny Loggins was there and Al Giro was there and the guys from Toto were there and Luke Ather was there, who I didn't know yet, who had actually sent me a complimentary, left me a message because he Rich had played him something and Steve Luke Ather, man, I, I think I kept it this day if I could find it because Luke, went on and on about my guitar playing, which is so generous on me. He's, he's that kind of guy anyway. We became friends later, but, but you know, I was so thrilled that Steve Luca there. Had found right. me in. Well, he was there at the showcase and all these people were at the showcase. And I will tell you, man, we were fucking killing band. Mr. Mr. I mean, I knew it because I'd had a, Kenny Loggs and asked me to go on the road with him and air He's supplies. He's a tough guy, man. 
Huh? He's, a very, he's very demanding if he's wanting you to Kenny. play. You're, yeah. yeah, I mean, I went over to his house too and played, and he was asking if I'd go on the road with him. And I said, man, I'm putting together something with Steve and Rich. I, I remember his line to me. He goes, I'm going to ask you to marry me. I just want to get, get a tour. I, just, I said, I'm doing something with Steve and Rich, who he knew. And I said, I just sounds, you know, it just seems like this is fucking, this is like something. And so, and it was. Everybody in that band was strong and everybody brought their own contribution to it. Nobody's telling each other what to play. I mean, a little bit here or there, but I mean, basically it was just like, it was just, a, it was truly that combination of four great talents, all having sort of different influences, you know, Pat and I were more rock guys. Steve was really a jazz guy. Rich was really R&B, but it just kind of like, you know, there was something going on. And so we played that showcase and that was a, I'll never forget that night, that, that particular night. Cause it was just such a, I had my friends out too and everybody was, I mean, backstage, all these stars are like, Jesus Christ, this is, you guys are fucking amazing and blah, blah, blah. So needless to say, and also we had Peter McKeon who had produced uh, Men at Work, okay. two, both Men at Work albums. And so he had, I don't know, 15 million albums under his belt or something, big success at the time. And he was already into it. So he was part of the package. We got our deal with RCA. Paul Atkinson signed us with RCA. And that's how Mr. Mr. started. That's such a cool story. So uh, Clive Davis is also the Pete Best of. <laughs> in, in a sense, right? In, a, in, in one small sense. Yeah. <laughs> I think he was fucking Paul McCartney in a lot of other senses. Yeah. yeah, I think so. But what a cool story, man. What were some of the challenges early on about getting the band up and running once you got signed? <clears throat> well, you know, uh, I don't know, man. I mean, we went, we went and then we rehearsed with Peter. We did an album with Peter called, you know, um, I Wear the Face, it was our first album. And I don't, Peter, I got to know even later in life. He's a very nice guy. I, it wasn't good timing for that record to be made in some way, that's what I'm gonna say, between people and things that were going on. And that record sort of lost it in translation, I think. Mm -hmm. I think when it was fresh and live, it was really strong. I think we got some life beat out of it by the time we made the record. And it didn't, it just didn't really come off, I don't think, way it might have that's i guess my polite way of putting it <laughs> but anyway it was and that's how it did. that's what it did it didn't do anything we went out and did some opening we opened for don henley for three shows we opened for madness for three shows we opened for berlin for three shows you know and then that was kind of the end of it so there's that moment you know in, in a record deal those days you'd sign like a seven record deal it'd be one record an option to pick you up for two more an option to pick you up for two more their option yeah. Two and two and two. And so, you know, this was a moment when they could have said, no, nah, it didn't work. See you guys later. But somehow, Paul uh, Atkinson, still believing in us and convinced them. Plus, we said, we want a shot at producing it ourselves. Okay. We have a lot of record experience within the band, particularly Steve and Rich and Pat. That's probably the least amount of record experience of the four of us. But we want a shot. We want to hire an engineer to co produce it. So we had different. Um, recommendations. One was Paul de Villiers. Now, Paul was a South African guy and he was on the road currently with Yes. He lived in Canada at the time, he lived in Toronto. But he was on the road with Yes, who was, you know, huge right then after their, I can never 9021, whatever the fucking number was, but you know the album with Only Lonely yeah. Heart. Right? Um, it was so we nine, I think it was 90210. It was all right. Yeah. I'm just amazing myself tonight. You yeah. guys have a good moment. It's all coming back to me. This is golden, tomorrow man. Be, tomorrow will be Steve who? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I played guitar. But um, <laughs> we went down to Irvine Meadows, that, that venue down in Irvine. Uh, but we went down to Irvine Meadows and saw Paul mix live sound. And it was so clear he was so musical because they were doing things where he was pressing buttons right on the orchestra head or this, that. And he was real dynamic mixes, not just finding a balance, letting it go. It's good, like real good. And so we got together with him. I think Mark Jordan, yeah, Mark Jordan, who was Canadian, who was an artist that George Giz also managed, was a cool artist. I think he recommended Paul. But anyway, so we got together with Paul and said, let's go and cut something. I, I think Paul came down, we rehearsed a little bit. We had already been writing the, the, the record that became Welcome to the Real World. And, and by the way, that significantly, I would say that now we were writing as a band. Like if you look at the credits on the album, Everybody's involved. I mean, I'm a writer of seven songs on the album. Not solely, I'm just saying a lot more of an evolution where we are aware with all of our influences, writing and otherwise. And of course, this is a different era too. Yeah. And so 
you know, Broken Wings had been written and been worked out. All these songs, I think all the songs now had been written and we worked them out. But Paul came in, we might've changed some arrangements to this app, but then we went in and RCA gave us, cut loose enough money to go uh, four days or whatever it was in the studio. And we wrote, we recorded four songs. Broken Wings was one of those four. And I remember Atkinson coming down listening and they, it was kind of like record company said, keep going, man, keep going. So we co-produced that with Paul de Villiers, who was a major influence on this, brought a lot to the table, but we had a lot to say about it. And, um, and it, it, that's even got to show where Richard Page and I had a lot of differences. We had more differences after that album than we did right during that album. But, you know, I, I ended up, I'd stay down at the mixes with Mick Gazowski or Mike Shipley just to make sure they didn't bury my guitars because they were prone to have really light guitar mixes. That's just what they like. Yeah. Like guitar mixes. So, I mean, I would stay down there the whole time just kind of policing it and making sure, you know, like. That sucks you know, to have to do and that. The guy and making them, you know, because really Pat and I were the more aggressive music guys. The other two were more the cerebral music guys which all plays a big role in one of these. Sure. And, 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 and at the end of the day, like when we're mixing the West, Welcome to the Real World, I mean, we'd go out to my Jeep Cherokee and listen to my Concord cassette stereo. And that's, that was our final, you know, we listened to them on the Aratones and the SN, uh, SN10s and the, and the big speakers and all that stuff. But then we go out, you know, you always want to listen to the Ghetto Blaster or something. Yeah. I remember we'd go to my Cherokee a lot to listen to the mixes of Broken Wings and stuff. But um, yeah, I don't know. What was the question again? <laughs> it was uh, what was the challenges early? You're like right oh. on point, man. Your your oh. answers are right on point with the questions, man. Honestly. Well, the challenge is that was a big challenge. Just yeah. The record deal. Yeah. And then you know, like I say, then we stayed at it, man, and everybody was involved, man, and everybody was doing it the way we wanted to do it. I mean, there was really a moment in life for me because I'd go home when even on the first time you go home, and then you realize you're really responsible for what you're putting out there. Nobody's telling you what to do. Now you're the artist. I had a great conversation with Pat Leonard who produced Madonna was friendly years, years later about this, but you know, now you got nobody to blame, man. Now you got to really sign off on shit and say, that's what I, that's what I want it to be. To the point of like on that Welcome to Real World album, I wasn't happy with, I think as many as four of my guitar solos, meaning the takes or the performance or what I played. And I had to raise a stink that wasn't real popular. I said, I want to go recut them. I want to go, I want to go recut them. The Why solo. wasn't that popular? They thought they were good. So you're just saying, uh, you're okay. more money. You know, whatever. Just, you know, that's yeah. what, you know, what are you just jerking off Steve because he's such a perfectionist, which I am, which they kind of all are. But I'm, I'm notoriously perfectionist. Probably more obsessive back in those days than I am now. But I mean, just, yeah, man, I just, that ain't it. That ain't it. That's not right yet. So I hired Tony Peluso, guy's name I mentioned earlier. Well, I like his engineering because he never fucked with my guitars. He made it sound like what my guitars sound like and mm -hmm. didn't fuss with it. And so I went in without Paul for a day. We went over to Soundcastle, I think was the studio. And I cut the solo on uh, Is It Love? Um, fuck, I'm trying to think what solos. Uh, Uniform and Youth. I want to say into my own hands. There were like three or four solos I cut over. And I was happy with it. I knew what I was going to play on, on Is It Love, by the way. I mean, that's, that's a solo that I constructed. I, I actually like, I'm going to play this solo. But of course, that can leave you very many times not sounding inspired when you play it because it's already in your head. Right. That becomes challenging, by the way. I could talk about other solos I've done like that. You, it's a great, you, your composition is really cool about it, but you got to make it sound like you played it the first time, you know. Whereas some of the rougher solos you did play the first time have that energy. Yeah. So, Anyway, but I nailed it. I played it good. I was happy with it. And I walked down. They were happy with it too. So we went on from there. Well, case in point of the guitar solo and isn't love, I could walk in that hallway right there and I've got a frame from a magazine called Guitarist, which was the equivalent of a guitar player in, in England, where some guy transcribed it as a solo of the month, you know. Oh, that's cool. And I, you know, talked about it's this and that. And I, that wasn't solicited. That wasn't promotion. That's some guy picked out my guitar solo. So I still got a frame that's 20 yards from us right now. That's cool, man. And I could tell I could tell you another story about that. I might as well tell you now, but on the next album go on, which was not very really successful, but I did I really stressed on a solo. I wasn't happy with the sound of that record. Partially it could be because of um, um 
Kevin Killen was a great engineer who had done so for Peter Gabriel and then we hired him and he was probably a little more hi-fi and a little tamer than I would be rock wise but I think more than anything I was always unhappy doing the record because I feel like the sound of the board we were on an SSL when SSLs were kind of new and they just had a shitty sound I, I want to Neve you know I just they just weren't warm and I was always fussing with my guitar trying to put it through Neve modules because it was like why does it fucking sound like shit why is everything so thin but so I was frustrated with that but but uh, we were playing. We were recording at the village, and I remember that I was stressing over a solo that was in a song I'd written called "Man of a Thousand Dances." And again, I knew what I was going to play, but I just kept doing takes. And I'm like, "This is not it. It's not convincing me. It's not it." Driving everybody nuts, of course. And I remember I went into, I watched a movie one Saturday afternoon called uh, uh, "Angel Heart" with De Niro and Mickey Rourke, and I went over to Westwood and I watched this movie. And for some, I don't know if you saw that movie, but it's pretty dark. I, I didn't. I, I didn't. That's one Daniel of the Daniel movies. He plays, he plays Satan. He's the devil in the thing. Okay. It's a, down New Orleans. It's kind of a dark freaking movie. I got down to the movie. I called Kevin Killen. I said, put up Man of a Thousand Dances. I'll be over in a minute to play that solo. <laughs> and then why do I play that solo? And that's the solo that's on the album. Now, I fussed over that. I did 500 takes on that song, bitch, if I did one. I don't know. I did three different, four different times with different amps. And I'll tell you, so many years later, meaning 19, maybe 2005, 2006, 20 years later, right. I'm in Nashville. I'd moved there and I'm out to lunch with a guitar player that had played with Dolly Parton and he was a friend of an engineer of mine. We're all eating Indian food and he goes, if you're not to groom you, man, that's a, that's a Nashville term. When they yeah, yeah. You, sucking Copy. up TV, you know. Anyway, I'd never heard it all. Even. Anyway, not to groom you, man, but I got to tell you, Every fucking guitar player in Nashville learned that solo off of Man of a Thousand Dances. Ah. C. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. C. I mean, it didn't make me any money, but it fucking came out good. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm always shooting for that. And so I guess the challenges of, of making the, the Bung Girl roll, that's a little one in, in my case. But it was just, you know, I think it also, we were coming, I remember sort of coming to, coming to our own, me personally. I remember like for the album, on, if you look on the album cover, it's this collage and I'm standing in front of it kind of like this and I got a red blazer on and a black t-shirt that says Omaha smack dab in the middle of nowhere or something like that. Just shit that you wanted to wear instead of some stylist telling you this is going to be this or that. Right. We just saw who we wanted to be and had a great attitude because it's like, no, fuck, this is what we are. And then it worked. I mean, that's, that's the beauty of the whole thing and said, well, we were right, you know? Are you still that meticulous or you uh, found a balance between insanity and huh. quality? Well, probably. I don't, I mean, as you know, I'm not really doing, you know, I'm not making any records. Right no, but in, in the, in, in things you in are doing. Yeah. In, in your yeah, hunting. I, and I think so. I think yeah. so. You get older. Well, you, you get older and you start to recognize even more and more what you're happy with or what you're, I'm sorry, no, no, don't distract me. But, um, no, I mean, you start to know where, when, the, when you've hit the target a little sooner. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. And you go, no, that is it. I, I am going to be happy with that. I mean, maybe that's it. Yeah. That's, that's insecurity. More like, that's it. Yeah. I mean, you got to be that way in business, too. And I'm doing so much business now. Last 20 years, I've become a businessman. I mean, I make land deals and crazy shit. I write up LLC operating agreements. I mean, and in business, and I mean, you got to be ready to go. That's the deal. Did your dad being in business help? Most musicians do not do, as you know. I know. Are, are they like allergic? Unfo yeah. And I say that unfortunately because. No, I know. I know. I'm, I've been very fortunate. I've said, I think even back in the Mr. Mr. days, it could be recognized by my manager, George, who would pit me against Rich sometimes when Rich would want to do certain tours because of personal things and all that. And I'm looking at Rich like, are you kidding me? We're hot right now, man. We might not be hot next year. You know, George yeah. knew I was more business oriented minded and thinking. I was more like pragmatic about it. Dude, you make the money right now. Yeah, make yeah. make hay while the sun shines. Absolutely, man. That totally, yeah. Because it's true, guy. Next album, we aren't we aren't, we aren't getting paid one hundred seventy grand a night anymore. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like so. You know, so yeah, I mean, I've had that, but I but I've certainly fine-tuned and developed into because it's, it's the passion about what i'm doing with land and stuff which i talk about hunting land and my deals and putting together partnerships and things and i'm passionate about it so i've gotten 
I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I guess like a lot of people, one of those guys, I, I get good at stuff that I really want to get good at. Mm -hmm. And I don't get good at a lot of th other things. So I don't really care about them. Sure. So we, in business, I've had a lot of fun being, <laughs> I don't know. I've got a big player that I've been, I sell some real estate because I got a license to facilitate all my own stuff. I, mm -hmm. I need to get a license to just do my own land deals. And anymore, I've, I've, for friends and stuff, I've sold some of their, but strictly hunting property and stuff that I really understand. And I've got one guy who says, you're the, he, he's a venture capitalist. He says, you're the best realtor I've ever worked with in my life. I go, that can't possibly be true. <laughs> but but I, I think it's just because, I, you know, you're a great salesman. I say, I'm, a, I'm not a salesman, man. Salesman is somebody who say, here, go sell this. It's a piece of shit. And that guy can sell it. That's a salesman. You're not in I'm the a convincing that, business. If I believe in something, I can yeah. convey why it's good. Right. I and that's good at selling too. But I mean, you can't give me something I don't believe in. I don't need to sell it. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just a facilitator of not of knowledge, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I want to just ask you about some of the guys you were, you, some of the people you played on their tracks uh, and how that came about. And maybe if there's a cool or interesting story about them or working with them, Johnny Winter. Well, <coughs> I heard you say that in my line of credits. Well, I've never met Johnny Winter in my life. Edgar, I did. See, I did a record with Edgar. With, okay. And I did a whole record with Edgar. And then they played three or four live shows with him around the country and got to really know him. Johnny did play on that record. Okay. Um, Johnny's a hero of mine, by the way. Yeah. There would have been a time in my life when it was probably about eighth grade that Johnny was the living shit. So oh, he was... he was a badass guitar player forever. What, what my closest thing to Johnny was, and, and Rick Derringer too, that I never met, was I'd done all the tracking for that record. For the Edgar record. Yeah. yeah. And they took that record to New York to have Johnny and Rick play on it. Okay. And Johnny, who suffered heroin addiction all the time, didn't own a guitar at that moment because he'd hocked his last one <laughs> and ended up not, I don't think he even played on it. Rick did. And then Edgar brought it back and then I played the solo that Johnny was going to play. Right. I guess that's the true story. Yeah. Sad. Sadly. Yeah. But I am a Johnny Winter fan. I mean, oh, I yeah. knew David Coverdale when I was in White Snake. We sit on the bus, and listen to old Johnny Winter tracks, and go like, Phew. "I mean, I may not have even appreciated him when I was that young to really know how fucking good he was when oh, I got yes. older." Like that fucking guy, you know, put how, how, Steve on and all those motherfuckers together, and you're like, "Johnny Winter, shit." So, how long were you in White Snake for? I did. I did a tour with him. I. I uh, I did the last hurrah tour, which you always got to love these names, the last hurrah, which was, you know, 25 years ago or whatever. <laughs> Almost not the not quite last hurrah. But this was 1997. I remember because I just got married to my first wife. And I left like three days later or whatever to go rehearse up at Cal Neva, this old casino that sits on the Nevada, California border up by Tahoe. And we rehearsed there three weeks and I went on the road. And we went out of the, we went out of the country. I never played a, I never played one gig with White Snake in the states. But I, we started in uh, Japan and went across England. We did the Baltics. We did Russia. We did Europe. We did you know South America. So I played with him for about six months and then mm. came back. And that's that's it. But I mean, I was it was a great time and it was a great. David was great with me. He was great to me. It was a lot of fun. So. Wait, a minute, was that is that was Doug Bossy on that gig? No. Bossy, uh, who I know, I know Doug. This is Doug. Doug played with him later. Than that, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah. My, must the guy who been. played with him right before me was uh, Steve uh, Vi. Okay, right, I played right. with him right after Vi. Right after Vi. And uh, Denny, Denny, uh, Armasi, Denny Carmasi playing drums. Adrian Vandenberg was also playing guitar still. Adrian and I were playing guitar. Um, God, what am I? At? Tony Franklin was playing bass. Hmm. And Derek, uh, oh, Derek, I'm so sorry. He was the least named guy playing keyboards, the sweetest guy of all. And he was playing keyboards. That was the band. Derek Sherinian? No. Why am I just having a fucking no worries. moment, boys? The, the, real, the reason I thought Doug might have been on that, because I think he rehearsed at the same place. And I think oh, I remember. That's because Coverdale lives in Tahoe. Oh, that's his thing. Okay. So that's his thing. I was like, whoa, that's okay. That makes sense. Um, tell me top three. What do you think? Knee jerk, just knee jerk reaction. Top three musical experiences you've had. 
Well, I, right away, I want to say musical experiences or sort of career experiences. I, I'd have to. Whatever you, that's whatever you want to say. I remember one time when I was up, um, there's a lot of them. So I, but just kind of, I guess, talking about fame or whatever, there was, I went up, I was still in Mr. Mr. And I went to play on an AIDS benefit when I was in uh, Boz Skaggs' band. We went to play the Bay Area for an AIDS benefit. And of course, all these Bay Area stars were involved, Bobby McFerrin and Boz and Carlos Santana. And I'm trying to think, you know, just the Bay Area folks. And we had a quick, re well, I heard two days down in LA and knew all Boz's tunes. And then we went up there and, and then we had like a kind of dress rehearsal on stage, you know, or, or, you know, sound check. And the different artists came out and they would play with us because we were kind of a band and we do one song. With them. And I remember when Carlos came out, he kind of, he's a, he's a musician, he wants to jam. So he just, whatever song we were doing, he just points at us and we were all taking solos and jamming. And he must've liked me enough because that night at the show, he had me walk out in front and gave me this massively long solo. Oh, and at cool. The, at the end was doing this to me. <laughs> and I go, I wish I had a picture of that. <laughs> I mean, you know, because it was in fact Carlos Santana. That's pretty so I remember really feeling good about myself on that. Um, musical experiences. I got to think of some stuff where I, oh, dude, I would play There's so many. I would play some of the latter years in LA. I'd go play at the Baked Potato. Have you, you heard of the Baked Potato? Of course, yeah, yeah. Well, the Baked Potato, I'd go over there and play with, with David Garfield's band. And Garfield was connected with Charisma, you know, Landau and all those cats. <laughs> and in the last couple years I was there, I became friendly with David and I played with David. And the band would be different guys because David was the gig. I mean, he had charts and we'd play charts and take long solos for the 200 people that wanted to see long solos. A lot of Japanese, you know what I mean? I mean, like people that were going to see these name players play their instruments. I remember doing some of those gigs and I mean, it might've been uh, Dave Weckl, it might've been uh, Vinny. I actually played with Vinny a lot, but I don't think he played with Vinny at the, at the big show, but it could be anyway, Alfonso Johnson, I'm playing, he's playing bass one time. It's just different major cats. And I remember killing on solos there, you know, and having that small group just cause I, cause I knew I fucking killed, you know, yeah. I'd go home to my first wife and say at the baked potato gigs, I said, oh, what a great fucking night. I said, man, I made 50 bucks. My bar tab was 60. So I'm only down 10. <laughs> I, said, I came home. I played my ass off with the greatest musicians in the world. I feel like a musician's great. Yeah. Those are great moments. Sure. I had plenty, man. I'd be on stage doing a, uh, big live things you know one time when i was playing this is kind of career more about i mean i went back to omaha nebraska to the omaha city guy that's where i'd seen gigs people play when i was a kid and then with eddie money and he entered you know he'd introduce the band last song you know he'd go across the stage stage right to left and introduce everybody and i happened to be at the far end of the stage and i told him before i said no eddie remember i'm from fremont nebraska not omaha and i got you man i got you so then he said, and last but not least, and mother and father in the audience, I know everybody's very proud of me here, you know, from Fremont, Nebraska, Steve Ferris. <sighs> you can imagine 10,000 yeah. people. Yeah. And I'm like, and I've got high school girlfriends and buddies, and everything down in front, you know, and I'm like. That's a nice, nice moment, man. That's one of the greatest moments of my life. Yeah. Very cool. I mix and sound came at the end of the show and gave me a tape, said, you might want to keep this. Yeah. Very cool. There's that. There's another time. There's again a very similar moment. It would have been Mr. Mister a few years later, and we're touring. We're it's 1986, and we're headlining. The Bangles are opening for us, and we're you know we're a big deal. We're selling lots of records, and so my whole life had changed. I mean, I'd gone home to visit my parents, and just the mobs of kids coming to a house looking for autographs, and my parents having to oh really so I, I couldn't go into a Denny's there. Just being wow, robbed. but. But that, that's not what I, that's not the story I'm tell. When he played it, we played a show at, in Lincoln. It was a similar thing. I walk out of stage, there's just banners. You know. Hastings loves you, Steve. You know, that's a town. Grand Island loves you, Steve. Steve you know, just the whole state was proud. I mean, you know, and when we, we <laughs> when there's a, a beginning of Curie, I would do this instrumental stuff with Slug, Steve George, we called Slug, but Slug would be on keyboards. We do this. We set it up, then eventually we sit down and Rich starts singing. 
And I play, and then I broke into da -da -ya -da 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 -da, which is the Nebraska theme song, the fight song. I was gonna, yeah, I played yeah. that across everybody. Was. Oh, <laughs> football in Nebraska, man! Holy fuck! Smoke. Fuck! Yeah, That's right. awesome. That's very cool, man. But there are so many, man. I can't. I can think of so many. If I thought about so many actual musical things, when you played really good with really good people you respected, and you and you kept up with them or impressed them, I mean, there's a lot of it. It's just so great. As you know, uh, you can only usually serve only one master. So what was the trigger that made you finally decide to serve nature instead of music? Well, I've always been, as you said earlier, I mean, it's just been my love. That was always what I was <coughs> getting away to go do. You know, that's my break. You know, that's my reward. I you know, go hunting or I go out. So, I mean, that's always been there. I used to say even when I was young, God, if I could figure out a way to make a living hunting, that's all I'd do. All right. Well, then you equate that with being a hunting guide, which is probably somebody that's a plumber the rest of the year or doing something else. But it's not hunting season, you know, and it's longer. But my toy that I always wanted was hunting land. I mean, since I was a little kid, we didn't own land. We had permission out on certain lands, but, but duck hunting, real duck hunting requires water. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, and, and, even back to the forties, my dad would tell you in Eastern Nebraska, all the good stuff was leased up or owned. And you didn't knock on a door and get permission to hunt ducks. You did for pheasants or something, but not ducks. Why is that? It's, it's, it's so cool. Well, the water, just, just, I don't know, man. People just want, you know, I, I've, I've learned that out here in the more remote areas. I back when I've been that age, you could have knocked on the door, but just saw it after that. Just planned them in. You know? So, so anyway, but the point is I would work for guys that, where guides were so I could go with them hunting. I mean, I just dreamed about having my own place to hunt ducks. And I said, if I ever make any money, I'm going to buy my own place. Well, I, in Mr. Mr. in the eighties, I should have done it. I didn't get around to it. I was busy. And of course I could have bought everything for nothing compared to what it would be for now. But, and I, then I, you know, the career kind of went up and went down again. I didn't, I wasn't in a position, but later on in the nineties, I was putting together enough money. And I looked for about five years mainly in Northern California and Oregon for hunting land. I just wasn't finding what I wanted. And I saw an ad in the back of a Ducks Unlimited. I don't know if anybody knows what that is. Ducks Unlimited is a conservation organization focused on ducks. And geese. But it was back for a piece of land out by a town in Nebraska, Western Nebraska, which, which I knew of. And I thought, hmm. I started calling the realtor about that. His name is Mike Lashley. <laughs> and I started talking to more and more and I thought, well, this guy knows what he's talking about. He was actually one of the first guys to really specialize in hunting property. And, and I, this was probably September. I said, you know, my dad still lives in Fremont. I'll be back at Thanksgiving. If things still available, I think I might come out and see it. So I did. I brought my first wife with me and I came out and it spoke to me and I was like, this is the one. Now, the big thing on it though was this. It was twice as much land, twice as much money as I was ready to go, like everything is, the thing you fall in love with is always more than you can afford. Mm -hmm. Plus, it didn't have any water, meaning any ponds, sloughs, marshes, but it had the North Platte River running through it. Now, the North Platte River in the county I'm talking about is a game refuge. You cannot hunt it by law. Okay? You cannot hunt it. You cannot hunt on the river, and you have to be 110 yards out from the river to hunt. That's a statute in Nebraska. And actually, the only other place like that in Nebraska is where I grew up in eastern Nebraska. So I grew up with the same rule. And I'm a big fan of it because I'm a big fan of sanctuary and you have to have, to have good hunting, you have to have safety zones too. So, but, but the fact was it had no water on it, I'm a duck hunter. So two things had to happen. A, I had to learn to build the duck hunting or find agencies that would help me do wetlands or whatever. And B, I thought, how can I fucking afford this thing? Well, maybe if I put together a hunting club, like I've always thought a hunting club should be, I'll do it my way. I can make this make some cash flow sense. So this was, how did you yeah. think of that? How did you think of that? You had must have had exposure to hunting clubs or something. Oh yeah, yeah, I knew what hunting. Okay, clubs. yeah, okay. Yeah, I also knew about wetlands restoration because one of my good friends, a guy named Gary Zom, in uh, California, he was a he worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He managed federal refuges. Big hunter. We were big friends, and I learned a lot from him. And I used to know a lot about what could happen. You know, this guy was a master managing habitat. That's what his job for the government. Older guy and great guy. Um, so I just want to interrupt you one second, just so I understand. I'm, 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 so but basically what you're saying, there is a process to put wetlands on a property without. 
well, either put what put it on or or, or restore them. And I can tell you okay. about that. Yeah. Okay. Great. But the point being, I had to create the type of habitat and uh, topography, and you know, lo- I had to make it into a duck hunt. Yeah. Holy shit! What a project. So I call. I look at it at Thanksgiving of 1999. I make an offer. I want to buy about a fourth of it. It was on both sides of the river. I wanted to buy the western half of the south side. And I called the realtor and make an offer and the seller said, no. He said, I'll break it in half, north river, south river. I won't bust it up anymore now. So I come out again in January. I said, can I hunt it? Can I hunt on it to try it out? So you want to like, sa- like sample? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I went on an alfalfa field by myself with a what's called a layout line and decoys. And I shot limits of geese three days in a row which you can do on land, but not water. Um, and I started, and I also out there, I called my friend. I said, who do I call about wetlands restoration? He said, call Rick Warhurst in Bismarck, South Dakota, who's with Ducks Unlimited. I call him and he goes, well, not me, but call Kenny Dunn and Kirk Schroeder from US Fish and Wildlife Service in Grand Line, Nebraska. So I call and I get Kirk Schroeder on the line. You remember all these names. I'm so impressed with myself. Today. I, I, this is impressive, man. And Schroeder, I started telling him, I say, my name's Steve Ferris. I live in California. I'm out here looking at some land and this such such county and blah, 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 blah. I'm trying to set if I buy it. And I'm interested in finding out about the possibility of doing some habitat restoration. And I've only got two. Can you get out here within the next two days? And he goes, laughs at me like, yeah. And he goes, I know who you are. He said, I read an article about you in Nebraska Land Magazine. because they'd done an article about me hunting in Nebraska Land years before. Okay. I, I go, okay. And he goes, Where the, give me the coordinates, the legals. I do. He calls me back by nine and a half. He goes, we'll be out Saturday. Oh, wow. So he comes out with another guy out of, out of a nearby town, both fish, both federal fish and wildlife guys. Now, do you have to pay for these guys time and all that stuff? No, no. Or th- no. Okay. No, no, you couldn't pay them. I mean, th- that wouldn't be part of it. You can't pay the government, but I'll okay. tell you. That first but anyway, it's their job and they're interested in restorations of habitat. Okay. So that your interests yeah, are aligned. Yeah. You should use fish wildlife services, protection and restoration of all species, you know? Okay, great. Or, so anyway, they're coming out looking at it. We walk the property and we're talking about what it is, the potential. And they're telling me that a lot of the funding for wetlands restorations is, is part of a program called Wetlands Reserve Program, WRP. And most of that's going to a different area in Nebraska because of a different whatever. But the point is there, but they said, we could get you involved in a Partners for Wildlife project. We'll find the funding here and there. Well, try to speed this up. Yeah. I entered a little, a little contract that I'm partnering with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Nebraska Game and Parks, Ducks Unlimited, and my own money. And we put together a, the first phase of a restoration for slough restoration. Slough is being meandering wetlands, shallow water wetlands, which is the habitat you want. And I even start designing it on a computer and drawing it out. And they take my drawings. They, they, they take some of it to heart. But I'm out here involved with them the whole, watching how we do it, how we flat, da 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 and I'm sort of fighting with one of the guys who was in charge because I wanted a certain way and, you know, and then he'd do it a certain way when I'd leave. Like I, I, I left, I had to go back to California. I said, I'm really happy with this spot, really happy with this spot, so don't change it. And that son of a bitch changed it after I left. So of course they left and I called a dozer and an excavator came back and I put it back the way I wanted it <laughs> two weeks later. And that's kind of how, how it goes. And I never, I've, I've never had anybody else design any of this on me and I have now owned seven properties that I've designed and developed. I've worked in four states with other individuals doing it, including the Fish and Wildlife Service, unbeknownst to those guys, hiring me and sending me to Oregon to do a 25-acre wetlands restoration, implement, design and implementation on the Wood River in the Klamath Basin. I love that credit because it's just one of those, no biologists, no schooling, which is the same as playing guitar. I'm not a school yeah. guy. Self-taught yeah. everything. And that's why I'm doing that kind of work. So, but back to the original deal i put together a hunting club and of course i had a lot of struggle you know trying to make it monetarily work and going through different guys that are good members bad members but this is the point of this is this was god leading me into my next phase of life the two things i didn't go to look for hunting property was one was how to make a living though that could have been more plausible the other i would never see coming is a creative outlet and that as i will say or been quoted in an interview before is like I was an artist when I started, painter. I was a guitar player, 
and now my paintbrush is the long arm of excavator yeah something like 60 feet long drawing on the earth which is probably the greatest creative project i've ever done i've been doing it 20 years and i am changing the earth and watching wildlife respond to it not record company guys and opinions and politics and people doing whatever they fucking think they need to do for their lives it's definitive with wildlife they respond you're probably right and so i go greatest creative process in the world makes sense yeah man 100 percent. and i'll tell you what is really nice the uh your level of uh fun slash passion that is like very loud man so i'm really happy yeah that's real that's yeah that's really yeah. cool because like it's you know you're like it's like when you probably 30 years ago and you say hey man i got this idea for a song and we'd put yeah. the solo you know and i could just see that and check feel that sound, man check out the sound. yeah 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 that's really cool man how you I mean, and i tell you there's a a ton of gratification when you do something on your own and you haven't had any education and, and it's just like you know sweat equity and yeah, that 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 may that does feel good because I've had yeah. that situation. You said the word sweat equity quite literally, even in terms of mo making money on a steel. Right. You know, the first place I bought myself, the second place I went and found guys that wanted to pump in with it. On you know, I mean, it's in a financial sense. God, I should have been doing this long. Like, I mean, it's 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 been tremendously rewarding, but because of incredibly hard work. I mean, work that you love, so you do it. Sure. But my wife, my current wife, I hate what a great term, my current wife, like I'm going on to another one. <laughs> but my wife, who has been out here for the last, we've been living out here now for the last 12 years, I think, something like that. And she, I've heard, I've overheard her when she's telling people, especially we've had a really big year on a couple of things. I sold a ranch and, you know, business wife, I've had some really good things happen. This year. So, and she, as she's talking about, she says, and she's my biggest fan. I didn't really even know. I mean, actually, she's a fan. She loves me, but but she's just said this guy works like nobody I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. tenaciousness. And I, yeah, I know I'm that. I was that way with guitar and everything else. I think when I th and here's the common denominator. I've said that about people with advice for you. The one common denominator I've seen in all the guys I know that have made a lot of money or are very successful is they all work their ass off. You have to. There's no free Period. lunch. That's it. There's, there's, yeah. there's some guys that have inherited money and so i'm not talking about them i'm talking about no. the guys that fucking made shit happen yeah all work their ass off and i and you know what i've noticed uh because i'm i come from business world i'm not I have yeah. this is my only you right. know I, I love what i'm doing but this is my i didn't come from the music industry and doing this and creating a few things um the people that have worked mm -hmm. are to get it are totally humble regular guys wearing jeans drinking yeah. beer whatever the hell it is they do and the ones who have inherited there's a marked difference they they don't know who they are they well, haven't had to learn who they are it's, yeah you don't have that connection well also when you've had to kill yourself for something you know by the great there i go by the grace of god the next day it could be gone. when you never had to work for it you don't have that no. there's no skin in the game it's like hey i got this shit Oh, that's that's all of it. That's all yeah. skin. Yeah. Like I said, I've been selling real estate now because I it's because I fell into it. It's really cool, actually, you know. But it's it, great. Uh, well, it's great because hey, it's monetarily really well, does really well. But the other thing, the reason I can do that, I wouldn't be able to sell a house. Again, this goes back. I'm not a salesman. Yeah. But I can talk about duck property in this part of the world. I don't know who could talk about it better. I don't right. think I'm even bragging. But you want to know why? I'm the one realtor that owns all the property and yeah. built it all. And made all the fucking mistakes and blew all the money. Right, exactly. I know where the money was spent well, where it wasn't. I'm the dude that did all the. I got all the skin in the game, yeah. so I can. When I walk out and probably with people, I'm saying, "Here's what you need to do here, and here's what you need to do, and this is why I kill you on this." And you know, I. That's been that's been the reason why. Yeah, you trade experience for that now. Yeah, you know, I, I think it's a lot. It's like. Eh. But it's cool that everything you're doing sort of like, you know, one pocket and the other pocket and you're like, and it's, you're, it's all part of your, like your universe, your world. It is, is really it nice. Is. It is. It yeah. Is. And there's no, no denying my whole music career and everything I learned from that doesn't play into everything. I did. Of course. Yeah. I'm yeah. Networking first off, you know, seeing opportunities of people you need to know and keep it. I mean, just that whole thing of, 
I mean, confidence too. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, play in front of big audiences, you need to, you might not be confident about everything, but you're confident about that. I mean, yeah, yeah. I was saying, man, I don't, <laughs> you ever get scared being on stage? I said, I'm just scared if I'm not on stage. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's usually, that's, that's the comfort zone where you go, like, I got this. But, so. Tell me your top three hunting or nature related experiences. So you smile before I, can, yeah, you I smile can, before I, I even can, finish the question, man. Oh, you're I like, can, it, you're I beating. You, I can almost nail that one right in. Yeah, man. I've had a million great hunting experiences and you know, so many great hunts. You can't even thousands at this point in my life when it comes to ducks and what I really know. I'd have to think about them. I mean, just things that I've seen that you see. If you're out long enough in the wild, you'll see shit. What's the you know, wildest never, or craziest thing you've seen that you never expected to see? Oh, I'm just talking about even just numbers of, I've been in, you know, with where 50,000 mallards are hovering around me. You know, like 50,000 mallards. 50, Holy crap. I've seen things. I, I can't. Well, other hunters do too, but I mean, you, you see it by virtue of being, if you're out enough. Yeah. You know, I was walking out to pick up a duck one time that was wounded. I'm walking to pick him up and he's kind of flopping along. Sorry, but they do. And you go pick him up and you dispatch and put him out of their misery. That's part of hunting, but. And out of my corner of my eye, when I'm 10 feet away, whoosh, a, a prairie falcon, which is the same size as a peregrine, comes down and hits this fucking duck. Now, I don't know if you know how, how falcons kill. They don't grab like other hawks. They just, they're so, they go 260 miles an hour on the dives. You can, you can Google that. Wow. They go down and they, they hit in the back. Is that your they, cell phone or is that a real phone? Nick? That's the phone. Oh. That's, my, that's my iPhone. Okay. But anyway, they go and... A falcon will go down and actually hit with the back of their knuckles. It's just force. And it knocks whatever it hits silly and they fall out there. They're notoriously bird hunters. They even call peregrines duck hawks. And they knock them out of the air and then go down and eat it. But that's how they, that was killed. Well, this, in other words, this one didn't come down and grab that duck. He hit it. And I looked back to my guys, my hunters in the blinds. I said, did you? Yeah, they happened to be watching. And that duck was dead, man. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I... He just hit it for, and he, he, that, that hawk, I got to think, then that, he was so engrossed in his dive, he probably didn't realize he was next to a human. He saw him and he just flew off. But I mean, those are things you go like, not everybody gets to see that. Yeah, that's pretty. And I'm looking out the back window right here one time, and I see a couple, I thought it was a coyote coming along, and they realized it's a bobcat with two kittens that are mostly grown. And they go over here, I've got so there's some old tree piles over there, and they go walking into there, and freaking rabbits come running out everywhere. <laughs> And the mama cat comes out, sits out there for a while, just sits there and waits. And pretty soon a young bobcat comes walking out with a cottonwood, cotton tail in his mouth with his legs kicking. And they walk off. I said, this is freaking Discovery Channel, man. Yeah. I mean, just I've seen a million things. I, I couldn't, I, I'd have to go on and on. I've seen things in Africa. What did I see in Africa that was really a great experience? Well, I have to think about it. But I can tell you in terms of hunting accomplishment. Yeah. Um. I didn't deer hunt until I owned property for five years. I just didn't grow up that way, but I own I owned some really good deer hunting property. And I sell deer hunting as part of the business and I wanted to learn more about it. So I got involved and started learning it. Well, I got good enough at it to do some stuff. And I have taken three monster, huge white tail bucks. And if you're not a white tail hunter, you don't realize it, but this is an extremely sought after trophy. You don't realize it because we live in America and a lot of white tail deer are killed because there's a lot of hunters. Right. But I've learned that you can have all the money in the world and be able to hunt across the world in Africa and everything and every safari. And one of the hardest trophies to get is an American white tailed deer. That's truly a trophy, truly big. Interesting. Because they're really elusive and they're really, the only reason that many are killed would be just by numbers. There's that many people hunting them. But you can, I just, a guy last year came out to me, he's in his seventies, shot polar bears, shot everything in the world since the fifties. I still never shot a big white tailed deer. And he finally shot one on my property. Oh, wow. Well, I've shot three and they're on my properties. That's another big part of why they mean so much to me. I yeah. probably wouldn't even go on somebody else's property. I've been invited to, to this. They're like, they're like property trophies. Mm. That's me nurturing the habitat, taking care of it, not shooting bucks before they're mature. It's all these things. And then putting incredible amount of time in like, I got one sitting over that I shot. I, I knew he was on there because we were using trail cameras. I had four encounters with him before I ever shot. I mean, it was one time right under me, but I couldn't get my bow around. Just things. 
and I finally, I probably hunted him 16 days and then got him. I might not have got him. Wow. I shot another one same way. And then lat, then I went, that was 2010. I shot a really, really big deer and I shot a really, really big one in 2011. And I finally shot another one this last season, 2020. And I have hunted every day of every season in all that time and never. Oh, hunted. wow. So they are waiting, elusive. Waiting for the right one. Passing on other ones. Passing on yeah. some that people would, wouldn't pass on. Right. I don't know if that translates here to people listening to this show, but those are like, duck hunting will always be my love. Hmm. But I will say when you walk up after you have conquered that um, goal and appreciated that animal for everything he is, and of course we eat him too. I mean, eating the whole thing is a beautiful trophy and the respect sure. you have. You walk up and you go like, okay, I get it. It's really fucking special. Well, it also sounds like you've taken so much care and like, like you just said, you're not, you've passed on a lot of the ones oh, because, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're good, good deer hunter, good deer hunters do good yeah. trophy hunters. Do. You pay, you have to learn to pass. You have to learn to judge them. You have to learn when they're really big or not. I mean, when you're new at it, you might not know that. I mean, you might think something's big when it's not, and that's a common mistake, but you start to really look, you know, the length of their ears to this. I mean, there's the whole thing to it, man. I mean, there's, I really have developed a huge respect for good deer hunters because mm. they just are not easy animals. Man. They're very elusive, very smart. So that's a big moment for me. You mentioned low points. Tell me some low points or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Well, there's a lot of them when you're in music. There's just a lot of uh, nothing going on. You know, am I going to work again? I played this thing and I know I sucked that night and everybody else knows I sucked. That's the last thing I heard me. I didn't get that gig. You know, um, I mean, there's that. What, what I learned, and I've had personal things too when I got divorced, you know, my first wife, it was just kind of the way it all came down. I, would, I won't dwell on this forever, but I, and I think other people would relate to it. I mean, just divorce. But ours ended up being kind of really amicable divorce, but they all suck. Uh, so, I they're horrible <laughs> they're horrible and and when this went down the reasons it did go down i felt like you know i've been wrong about everything my whole life <laughs> since i was three i think i've been fucking wrong i mean you go through i went through a real <laughs> dark time but i came out of it i mean you really yeah. i was like everything's wrong you, you have kids or no i don't my wife thank god had two almost grown, they're, we have grown her kids and we have yeah. six grandkids. So I get to enjoy that. That's cool. Yeah. But back to the other thing I adopted early on in music, I knew the survival was to right away digest the idea that nine out of 10 things that are supposed to happen, or maybe 19 out of 20 things that are supposed to happen, aren't going to happen. Most things you think are going to happen aren't going to you get excited about a million things most of this shit isn't really going to come together that combined with the idea that until i do all those times i'm not going to make it so right away one rejection one failure after another you're just like oh good one more out of the way so you were able to do that yeah yeah i was able to at a point i did up to that and that came about after i'd gone to la maybe after about a year i was just like i did have a good friend um Donnie Edelbrock, he was a saxophone player in my band in Iowa called This Side Up was the band. He was a very dear friend, died really early age, of cancer, a brilliant musician. But he was like, he was kind of a very sort of hippie sort of organic guy. And he said to me, I, he was like my big brother. He was about six years older than me, but I, he asked me to join their band and they were these great musicians in Iowa. And I used to just listen to him, he was kind of a mentor. And he said, Steve, there's a, there's a, there's a certain amount of hours you have to have on stage before you earn the right to make it period until you get those many hours out you don't have the right hmm. i don't know why he was kind of professorial at a point yeah. and so that was in my head anyway but then when i got to LA, i said this is the way it's gonna do it man you're gonna it's gonna suck it's not gonna come together and when you think it is and so you you remain in every band you can be in you go to every fucking jam session you can do you play everywhere. And I'd read this, I think, from Robin Ford or Larry Carlton. I say, somebody said it back in the old days. I haven't been a drummer, I'm trying to think of, but you know, just what do you do when you get to LA? You play with everybody all the time. Yeah. And you join every fucking thing you can be in. And so, you know, you're, you're in six bands at one time, you're mm. balancing everything out. And sooner or later, maybe something sticks. 
Now, the other, the other part of that is being able to know which road to take when you come into all the crossings. So I'm going to do this one or do that one. And somehow God's looked out for me or given me the ability to make good decisions. I mean, clear back when I was in high school, join, leaving one band to join the better one, just realized yeah. that I need to do this. I got an offer and this is the way to go. Or, and that has played a big, a big role in my whole career is just making right decisions. Hmm. Who to play with and what to join and what not to join. All that. I'm going to ask you to uh, talk about gear for just a minute. Uh, sure. And you said you had a Valley Arts Strat. What's your go-to guitar? I know you haven't played. You're not a playing now, but what's your go-to right now? Or, you know, what guitar do you like picking up the most right now? Well, I think I told you earlier that, you know, I really just don't play hardly at all anymore. And that seems so weird to everybody. But I, like, you know, I quit. I last painting I painted, I was 22 years old, last one. And then I went through a life of music and I kind of don't do music anymore. And yeah. I build blues. So I kind of, I'm one of those guys that does that. But having said that, back to guitar, I have a Tom Anderson strap hanging, hanging in the other room. Great with guitars. A, with a PV, the prototype of the classic 50 PV with the four tens, small pedal board with some shit on it. You know, I take that, like you mentioned Eros Ramazzotti, Italian guy. I, I took that guitar, I played everything on his album with that guitar. No, I think we've rented a couple of things over there, but that's about it. That's the kind of guitar, and you know this. It's certainly the jack of all trades, oh, master cool. of none in some ways, but really you can do everything with that guitar. And they're really, Tom is another perfectionist, precision builder. Yeah. I mean, I knew him a little bit when he was at Schechter, but I knew him more when he was at Anderson up in Santa Barbara. And I mean, you know, those guitars, they're just really, really well built to the point of, you could say maybe a little sterile, um, but not really. And the reason I say that is because I do own a couple well, several vintage guitars. I know I own a 1959 Strat and I know a 1960 Strat. Okay. Oh wow. And that 60 has never had a solder joint undone. I, I did have to refret it. But that motherfucker, when you play it, it's like God said, if you ever want to sell that, Steve, <laughs> I'll, I'll make you the best price. Um, <laughs> and that 59 is not far away. The 59 though does not have all original pickups. I had to have a rewind in one or two. And it had uh, some routing and stuff, but again, fat sounding. You got to work on them harder. They're harder to play. You got to you got to muscle them a little bit. You got to find them a little bit. But also mm. that makes that brings out shit with you too. Yeah. And sometimes you got to go, man. And I got to get a hold of that son of a bitch, and you have a different kind of attack to it. So there was a band I had together a guy named Julian Raymond, who was a record producer. And Julian Raymond and uh, one guy on on the drums we had a band for a while in the early 90s called on golden blonde and i don't know if you can find it on, on mp3 or whatever but it's some of my favorite guitar work i ever did on golden blonde that's so you, funny we, we released on mp3 i don't know where it is i don't even know if i could find it in my own shit because i lost so much stuff in that flood in nashville but that's some oh, of, my favorite, of that? my favorite guitar stuff i ever did was in that moment and I was using basically all vintage guitars and vintage pedals, you know, Big Muff, Fuzz Face, Vox Wah Wah. You know, it was the grunge era. It was sort of the latter part of the grunge era, so it was all going to that anyway. And I mean, I was a natural for that because when grunge came out, I'm doing sessions like playing on jingles. They're like, I got all the calls, a lot of calls because oh, like, Wah Wah? Oh, fuck, I got that down. Because I mean, <laughs> I grew up in that era. I mean, I grew up in the late 60s playing guitar when that was just how we all sounded and played. It was sure. and I was like, shit, I got this in spades. So I love the grunge here because it was I just like, oh, we're going back home. So <laughs> anyway, um, so that stuff on, on Golden Blonde, like some of that stuff that I played with that 60 Strat, just the fatness of the solo. I mean, through a Big Muff or something in a 50-watt Plexi Marshall, you know, you're like, fuck, man. I mean, because in the 80s, we got so into like, high output pickups you know 13 volts you know and it's like you know seymour duncan would make me my pickups like on the valley arts strat so we you know i had a, a jb pickup on that mm -hmm. valley arts basically that i don't know if seymour customized or not i don't know that it really was but you know you're driving everything really hard for the guitar well that works but at the end of the honest the, when you're loud you may not be hearing it really but in the end of the day when you're recording you start to realize it gets a lot of mid-range and Kind of can be nasally. It's not nasally sounds really amped up. 
bad like that, but I'm just talking, it's kind of, there's a narrowness to it where some of that older shit that had more top and bottom because mm-hmm. it wasn't driving it that hard. And you put that through like a fuzz tone to get the drive from something else after the guitar. Like you, then you listen to the recording like, fuck that son of a bitch sounds like a Mack truck coming at you this big around. Yeah. And that was kind of like what it, where it was at in the nineties. Like, let's just, you know, I, I wonder if I had done that on the Mr. Mystery, but we just weren't doing that. Then. Yeah. That wasn't your thing. But you know, and I had a, I have a, I still have, I have a Gretsch jet firebird. It sounds good, but you can't keep it in tune. Even if you know, said you can get it out, out of a Nazi prison camp tomorrow, if you can tune this, you'd, you'd still be in tune. <laughs> so, um, you know, just, but I would do track, I would do sessions with that. We play a verse, I'd say, stop, you know, punch me and I got a tune. I do the B section, stop, punch me in, play the chorus, because it's just always fucking going on tune, but sounded great. And uh, what else do I got? I got, uh, I got three gold tops. Um, oh, wow. Two of them are 68s, but they have PA, they have real PAFs in them, and they're fucking killer. And then I have one that Mike uh, McGuire, when he, who used to own Valley Arts when he was running the Gibson Custom Shop, he gave it to me when I went out with White Snake. So it's a, it's a historic production of the '57, but I put real PAFs in it. And that guitar, after the flood, really came to life. Interesting. And, I, I, and there's a lot of a lot of guys to tell you about that. That those, my fucking guitars were underwater for five days, and so, a lot of them pulled through, and a lot of them, and some didn't. But that one sounds better than it ever did before that. I've I've spoke to a few guys who've had both both situations as you just oh, River Relics. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what's your top three just for this minute? Desert Island Discs. Beatles White Album. Blow by Blow. Jeff Beck. Mm-hmm. Are you experienced, Jimmy Hendrix? Took me a long time to think about it, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Steve, tell me something that you want that you don't have now. Doesn't have to be something physical. It could be any, you know. There's not much, man. There's not much. I, uh, I can think of some personal things that I won't share. Um, it would not even be that interesting. Um, I mean, really. That's I'm awesome. Kind of, I'm kind of in a stage of life that I just, even particularly this year, like I say, some things came together this year that were sort of huge financial things that kind of put the lid on that worry i mean i don't have i don't have that kind of money to do like you said i never have to work it well but things are good yeah good for you i own my own hunting land paid for an incredible place here at the lodge i have a tremendous wife um who looks phenomenal and i think she'll look phenomenal until we die (laughs) (laughs) well that's good yeah that's awesome man um and a great person wonderful person i have that in my life i have good friends i have basically an interest a a boutique interesting life man it's i've kind of weeded out some of the shit that wasn't really worth having but you work for it man you you you, it's intentional yeah that doesn't stuff like that doesn't randomly happen no it doesn't and you know there you you always kind of joke you think yeah it only took me to age 64 to have it, you know, when you think, okay, so okay, finally for 20 more years or whatever you get. Right. But that's, right. Okay. that's it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's typical, really, isn't it? Yeah. I think so. Place. No, but it's it's good, man. I mean, I'm not very, you know, I can see something outside of me. I'm not very happy with politics of America. I mean, who is? Yeah. I, I see things going on in America that I wish would not be the way they are. I think there's just an incredible bunch of political crap. And dishonesty going on that just i mean i can't believe it you know, so i think a lot of people would say the same thing and i'm not even going to tell you which side i'm on probably guess but uh, <laughs> but you know you're like jesus christ this fucking country's but then again i do look back in history and new times before i was alive you go mary's gone through shit before so. yeah and and you, you do get some Here. weird comfort in that yeah that will you know this too shall pass sort of thing yeah, and I mean, I'm alive enough to remember as a kid the 60s and civil rights things and, and Vietnam and all those things. But I mean, there are things back in the early 1900s that were massive. Mm. You know, 
other, where it seemed very, oh, country's going to fall apart. But somehow America kind of pulls through. Um, yeah. pull through this time. We all hope. We all hope and pray. So, uh, what do you like most about yourself? The fact that as I get older, my pecs and my delts are getting smaller and my biceps are shrinking. No. <laughs> I don't know. What do I like most about myself? I like a lot of things about myself, man. I'm not afraid to say that. I like that yes. I've gotten to a place that I am confident about my work, my art, and uh, very comfortable in my own skin, very comfortable in my own skin. I think I probably like that as good as anything. I don't really have anybody I'm cowering to or afraid of, or I mean, it's just not that guy. I mean, I, I this is me, man. I'm, I, I'm happy about that. I got to live, like you hear you are calling me through my guitar world. You know, I got to live like that. I mean, I got to, technically I was a rock star. You were, not, not one of the biggest. Literally. Not one of the biggest, but literally if I look back, I go, yeah, I was a fucking rock star. Yeah. And even less, or even aside from that, I mean, I got to be a successful musician right. for a long time. I mean, that's a dream. And so I've been able to move on to other things probably because I really got to have that. I've told people, I said, it's not quite like, I wonder if it would be like if I go, well, I know what it was like if, you know. Now, did I accomplish everything musically I want to do? No. I think there's a lot of guitar playing about me that nobody knows about. Because, I mean, you know, you have to fit into whatever you're doing. Mr. Mr. I fit into that, obviously, well. Yeah. But, you know, guys that knew even more about some of my playing, because you would think of Mr. And Mr. being pop and more light. I had no idea right. all this. Yeah. Other, like, yeah. it's like another life. Then you go, well, that's because I melded that into what was appropriate for Mr. Mr. And I look back and sometimes I go, yeah, maybe that was a little too heavy for what we we're doing right there. I don't know. Maybe I'd do it differently now. But, you know, the, I'm very blues oriented, very much a blues guitar player. If I could sit on, if I'm just sitting up playing one thing the rest of my life, it's going to be blues. Yeah. It's going to be one, four, five progression. Mm -hmm. And, 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 uh, and I'm fucking good at it. Um, I grew up with it. So, and I, but I also put in a newer twist to it because I've just got a lot of other things going on. But, but, um, you know, and, and when I play some of these gigs and stuff, like live, later on in my career, like LA or something. And there was a blues guy I used to go play with, you know. Those were really rewarding to me because people would be around like, damn, well, yeah, I'm not playing a calculated pop solo in this fucking song, you know? Yeah. So I think there's things that a lot of people never got to know about me. And I read, or my wife, my biggest fan, and will read, drive sometimes, you know, go online and read Google things, you know, it might be my birthday, maybe from all over the world. And the things they say, you realize some people have followed and figured out a lot of, uh, the broadness of yeah. what I am. I don't think as a as a music success I got to do that. Like this, like that band on Golden Blonde. If that had been successful, I would have gone. Okay, right. right. I can go to my grave. So it, not everything got accomplished, but a lot did. Yeah, man, for sure. Uh, you've traveled all over, man. What's your favorite place you've traveled? Western Nebraska. Right on. Um. Out of the other places? Oh, gosh, I, I would, I, sh I, would have, I would have this answer normally. But I mean, if we're talking about out of the country, I mean, I remember like in Australia, but I was only there once a long time ago. Yeah. Um, I've been to Germany a million times. I used, to, I used to always really like Germany. I used to love England at a point. I don't know that I love England that much anymore. I was there not as long ago, and I'm like, eh, it's kind of changing. Um, God, where Italy? You know, I spent a lot of time there. I was playing with Eros, playing with Vasco Rossi, and playing with Eduardo Bonato. So I had this moment for several years that I was over there as a hired gun. Yeah, but I go do a record, I'd be there for a week, and that was it. But then I, when I played with Eros, I was there for four months, and they were okay. putting me up in Milan, and I was doing shows with them. And Italy it was a cool place. Now my wife, coincidentally, had lived three years in Italy in a previous life. And so she has experience. You know, we went back. We have her daughter was married to is married to a military guy. They were stationed in Belgium. So two years ago, we went and visited them. We took three days. We flew over to Italy and spent three days there. I didn't have the same experience there. 
But then also after realizing, yeah, and I wasn't exactly a rock star with people catering to me all the time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't quite the same trip. But you had uh, to place your own order for food. Yeah, and right, right. <laughs> and we had a couple bad meals in Italy, which is like you have to work to fucking do that. We found a couple bad meals. I'm like, how do we eat a bad meal in Italy? They don't have. Food. <laughs> um, but anyway, now I mean, I I don't know, man. I've I've had great fun in South America. I had great fun a lot of places. Great fun in Florida when you're playing the fruit. One of the first spring break concerts in Mr. Mystery. Yeah, I bet you and did. We're just, we're just on our second number one. It's like, yeah, things are good. This is yeah. Good. Uh, oh, just, I don't know. Just a few more. Track. I enjoy a lot of places. A few more questions. Toughest decision you had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do? That's one question maybe I should have read ahead of time. <laughs> I find everything else. I'm like, I you've, been, you've done, you've done, you've done great, man. Without, without reading. Yeah, I'm question. better. I'm better on the fly, man. I don't like to think I'll shoot. But, a lot uh, of people say that. Then they're like, fuck, I should have read the questions. <laughs> I'd get scared of reciting what I thought I should answer. You know, like, oh, yeah. Man. Also, I hate fucking reading. Anybody will tell you that. I've never read Do you really? Oh, I, I've never read a book in my life. Right? No. I write, I'm told that I'm a very good writer. And they say, you're obviously very well read. I'm like, <laughs> No, that's man. really interesting i got all great grades in school because i knew how to get great grades and read the back of a book and make a book report on it but i don't read wow my best friend in the world since we were one month old went into academia he was the president of the university of nebraska for 10 years now he runs the texas university system he's the chancellor at tu and we joke about it because we grew up together two months old but as a matter of fact he was hunting with us and so they wanted to know about me and they said did you play guitar too jb 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 and oh yeah, we all grew up playing guitar. He said, but you know, when she was playing Jimi Hendrix, I was still working on Happy Birthday. And he, <laughs> and he said, but I was pretty good at book learning, <laughs> you know that, because he was always like, you know, and I was the guy that we know. Oh, Ferris, he never read anything. He doesn't read anything. It's like it's a chore for me. Probably dyslexic. How do you? How did you read all? How did you read uh, all these Maybe chapter? You? Well, no, 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 no. Chapter and verse with uh, laws of land, you know, land development laws and rules. Oh man, I read some of that stuff, but I'm I'm still I saw it's still point look and see. I okay. Mean, I learned I learned things audibly and visually. Okay. And I do, and I learn well. Yeah. I have great retention for things, and I so. You know, it's just funny, man. I mean, I, it's funny to me when I'm told by somebody how much knowledge I have about something that I know I'm self-taught about, like maybe wetlands or something like, I really shouldn't have this knowledge. But trial and error, man. I mean, yeah. Just, Nothing like just, doing something, man. Yeah. I can't remember what your, what your question was. Hardest decision. Toughest decision you had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do. God, I don't know, man. I'm going to get stumped on that. That's all right. I'm really getting stumped. I've never. You know what? I will tell you what. That's so much a clear decision, but my mother died when I was, I'm kind of when I was, she was 72. Died a little young. Died in her sleep. Unexpected. Boom, done. 1996, I think. Sorry, man. Oh, no. Good way to go. Yeah. That's the point of the story because then my dad, on the other hand, went down the long, hard way. Not full blown Alzheimer's, but dementia. You don't want to go out that way. Yeah. And that was a few years in homes and facilities. And he used to say to me all the time, I want to, I want to just go live with you, you know, when he was cognitive, cognitive for a minute. But you couldn't do it. I can't him out here. I mean, I have to stand next to him the whole time. She's, he was that bad. Yeah. I do think that decision is always, I don't know. That's you know, wish you could do. You wish you could do more. That's a tough one. Practically, man. you know, you can't. Yeah. But, you know, you wish you, you know, and I went to visit him a lot. And I brought him, I went, he, he was in Eastern Nebraska, Omaha, which is five and a half hours from where I live. So it's a long drive. I went and got him for Christmas one year when he's still a little bit. We brought him out here for Christmas with just him and the family. And it was, I'm so glad I did. That's good. We wasn't together most of the time, but I will tell you this. Like the second morning, I'd forgotten to give him some of his medicine. And we went out hunting with other guys. I guess he was unruly. And, you know, I tried to give him a shower. He was taking a swing at me. You know, just, it was all going fucking wrong. But 
um, got him calmed down again. And the next day was Christmas day. And we had a Christmas dinner with my wife and her two kids. And I think we had one baby then and, uh, and dad. And my dad, Roy Ferris, anybody in Fremont, Nebraska would have told you was the best joke teller that ever <laughs> breathed. He knew every joke and he was phenomenal at telling them as were his two brothers, my uncles. They just were, that was part of life is being able to tell a joke, being able to tell a story. They used to call it a story, but great. And so I'm sitting here and he just seemed kind of together that night. And I looked at him, I said, hey dad, wasn't there an officer that pulled over a guy sometime recently? He goes, oh yeah. Pulled over and said, hey sir, do you want, realize your wife fell out of the car 20 miles ago? And he said, thank God, I thought I was going deaf. So, <laughs> you know, and so, and I said, and there it was man, all the way through. And I just kept feeding him a few. He told six or seven jokes immaculately. And I was like, Jesus Christ. And then he, he always liked pretty girls. So we had the music on and then he got up and he elderly could barely move. But he met dancing with my wife and with my wife's daughter. And finally says, I'm tired, time to go to bed. And they walked him out. He had a beautiful girl in each arm. And I thought, yeah. One of the great yeah. last moments of he was back. That's a good story, man. You're a pretty good storyteller yourself. Yeah, thanks. Uh, last question. What's the biggest change in your personality? over the last 10 years and how much of that has been intentional and how much has just been a part of aging? Oh, I don't think I do any of that intentionally. What's that? I don't think, I said, I don't think there's an intentional change. I think I have changed. I'm just getting older and life experiences changes. You probably mellow out some, you know, I was always pretty fiery, kind of had kind of a hothead. Um, it, it takes a lot longer to get me to that boiling point again. Now, you get older and mellow and all that stuff, and also realize what are the important things, what aren't. You know, that's a cliche, but I mean, that's true. Well, it is very true, yeah. And so, plus, there's so much more satisfaction, self satisfaction in my life of the goals I've accomplished have amassed to be more and more things that it gives you more peace. Yeah. So, no, I think. Uh, I'm happy with myself when I go into a room, you know, really once in a while, man, once in a while, I'll be uncomfortable in a certain situation with people because sometimes you just are going to be it's at odds or something. But even then, man, even when I go into people who like some meeting about something, maybe that would affect land around or something. I, I don't get too flustered. Man. That's good. And that's just life. That's life, man. That's just a lifetime of accumulation of finding yourself and being happy with yourself and happy with what you're doing, happy with the people around you. Well, man, let me, uh, I just want to tell people what a couple of things that you're going, you have that might interest some others. Um, and I had to beat Steve up to get this. So he's not asked <laughs> me to promote this, but I want to support everybody yeah. that comes on my show. Uh, first of all, um, if you're interested in, looking at some recreational property, especially in Western Nebraska, you will probably find nobody smarter than this guy to guide you through that process and educate you on what to do and what not to do, which might even be more important. Um, where would people look you up like for stuff like well, that? I, I, I guess, I, I guess, I guess we will promote it, but no, I'm, I am an agent with a company called Lashley land, L A S H L E Y. Great. Actually, land and recreational properties in Nebraska, and that's that's how you would find me in that arena. And it's funny because as a rock star musician, everything when you first start doing anything, it seems so pedestrian and so normal. You wouldn't do it. It's not artsy enough and anything. And I just fell into it because of my love for land. And it's yeah, become, it's become a really creative. Well, it's an interesting thing. Creative in that I put together all these creative promotions on the stuff. I fly, you know, fly drones, which everybody does in real estate now. Drone it, write up about it and make it, I'm still using my art, you know? Yeah. And that's why it's working. So I'm, I, at one point I thought, why the fuck not? And then I did one thing after another and I'm like, this is fun, drive around a property and show people how to build it and what it is and it's cool. Yeah, but it's like you said, you're not gonna sell a house, that's not your passion, but, no, man. and that's not where you could serve somebody really. Yeah, no, I've, I've said all along, I think I said it earlier, maybe I did went off here, but I said, I'm not a, people say, oh, well, you're a great salesman. I said, no man, a great salesman tells me, mm -hmm. Here's a scoop of mud, sell it, and you can sell yeah. it. I can sell soon, I believe it. Yeah. And that's why it works, you know. But. 
And also, uh, if you are interested in getting, you know, property, uh, I don't even know the right words to get it developed. Are you going to develop, it developed. And what is it called when you create well, pres it preservation of wetlands? Or yeah, I, I have a company called Ferris Hunting Development LLC, and I through that I developed these lands. Mostly, I've developed my own, but I've I worked in four different states for some different people helping them develop lands. When I say develop, it's not develop in the sense common sense like there's no strip malls yeah we're not, we're not putting like building Starbucks. yeah but uh but it's this is land habitat restoration and yeah to be honest with you what i do with the, my hunting properties i i tell people i said i'm a golf course designer so what do you mean i said man i'm the guy that's good at golf and says i've always wanted a hole to do this so i might do restorations of these meandering waterways known as wetland sloughs and i was joking so yeah, but if mother nature were a duck on her she'd make it bend a little more here because it would be hot <laughs> You know, and I, oddly enough, one of my members of my club is a guy named Tom Lehman, who was the top golfer in the world in 1996 or something. I can't remember his year. I don't play golf. So I'm, he's my good friend and my hunting member, but he's, he does, he designs golf courses because he's uber famous. Right. But it's the same kind of shit. It's not, doesn't make them the land engineer. Sure. Oddly, I've become that. And I, I run my own excavator. I run all the excavation stuff. I do equipment running and all that. But it's like, I'm just going, man, I want it to be this. And like we're moving the dirt let's make it exactly what i wanted to be because i want to put the degoys here and the birds are going to come in this way and blah 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 so it's an art project man. yeah and so i do it some for other people i'm pretty picky about i don't have so much time um about what i take on uh, and what i don't so it's not like i'm out hustling work but i do some of that yeah so if you have some interest in that and a legitimate interest in habitat restoration wetlands uh specifically for ducks and uh, along those lines, contact Steve through Lashley Land. Yeah, that's um, You can find me through that. Any final words of wisdom? Hmm. I can go final words. The wisdom part's what's going to be tough. <laughs> um, I didn't know it was going to be so demanding. I. <laughs> hey, it says on you. <laughs> yeah, God. I don't know, man. I uh, I've been very blessed. I think we all need to focus on whatever blessing we have and and dwell on the good good sides not the bad you know that's the biggest thing really isn't it i agree man and later maybe they become more good things you know so hey hold on one second i'll wrap up with you thank you very much for your time it's been really cool uh appreciate you talking and uh sharing everything and uh thanks for a lifetime of good music as well uh, thank you man appreciate it Hang on one second. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Steve Ferris for his really generous with his time and sharing all the cool things he's done uh, throughout his life, actually. And uh, most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I am out. Thank you so much, brother.